Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first time we're going to be streaming Pokemon. It's going to be a good one. This is the Pokemon VG Premiere Challenge. It's going to be a very good time. I'm your host for today, Matthias, also known as Matthias. I'm joined by Owen and Daniil. Yes, it's, uh, wow, to, to say I'm excited is quite a little bit of an understatement. Uh, you know, I... I mean, you guys have seen me on the broadcast before if you're a regular Saint Severe, but you might not know I'm quite the Pokemon nerd. Enjoy the battling system so, so much. And we also have the other Saints resident Pokemon nerd. You might know him as the Valorant nerd of the school, but he does have a side of Pokemon. Love to have him on for the first time on the Saints stream. It's an absolute joy mm -hmm. to be introducing you all to Owen Hybrid. Man, uh, please hey, welcome yourself. It's a crazy welcome. introduction. I don't know if I can live up to that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm the coach uh, at St. Clair for Valorant. But, you know, I'm a big Pokemon fan myself. Uh, pretty excited to see what we got going on here. It's the first time we've done any sort of thing like this. You know, mm -hmm. first time we've done any sort of Pokemon production. Won't be the last. I'm really excited. Really excited to see what we got going on. And it's going to be a great time. I hear we're loading into our first matchup pretty, pretty soon. But what are you guys hoping to see today? Let's get some... Uh, I know he set. wants to see uh, Ferrigraph. I know that For, much. Listen, Ferrigraph's <laughs> my favorite. I love the Trick Room sort of mm -hmm. teams. I just love, I love different strategies. Obviously, you got the you know the main ones of, of, out there, right? There's a lot of hyper offensive teams that you kind of mm -hmm. see all the time. Always seems to be the predominant strategy that the meta kind of falls onto, yeah. and then every other strategy kind of revolves around that. I I, I do <laughs> love to see just like different start, sort of things come mm -hmm. out of the woodworks. You know, the Trick Room teams. Um, you know, the sort of rain teams. So I'm very excited. Obviously, my favorite Ferrigraph. I want to see some sort of Trick room teams come out here um but overall you know we're kind of in a metagame in regulation f where you know there's a ton of different things that you can use there's not really one set team that is like dominating the format there's yeah, a couple of pokemon that. that dominate obviously like ogre pong <laughs> is really useful uh incineroar is really great mm -hmm. um but we're just in this really great meta where like you know any sort of format any sort of um team strategy is really useful so, yeah, yeah i'm really excited we're definitely going to see a lot of similar pokemon overlapping um but what i feel is really special about this format so far uh, in this metagame to be specific is like previous metagames have been very centralized on not just pokemon but whole team lineups and whole strategies you know, you got the rain teams, you got the sun teams, you got the stall, toxic stalls, and all of that. But this time around, um, in this generation, it feels like things are a lot more open to interpretation, and trainers have the opportunity to really express their creativity. Absolutely. And you can't forget about terrestrialization. That's an insane mechanic. It changes up how the game works it is, by yeah. a large amount. <laughs> it's also a well balanced ish mechanic yeah. ish. You know, <laughs> ish. Yeah. Ish. obviously like the, the niche mechanics are not going to be super like well balanced mm -hmm. but you know if you compare it to mega evolution you compare it to like yeah. z moves you compare it to gi like even dynamax like yeah. you know it's um i feel like terrestrialization just offers that you know strategy based element whereas like you can just gigantamax and then Boom, when sweep an entire team. Yeah. You know, mega evolution, boom, sweep an entire team. Whereas this I feel like is a little bit different, you know. For sure. But and gentlemen, hey, you know, we've we've been uh we've been getting a little bit ahead of ourselves so far. You know, we've introduced the tournament that we're doing here today, but what even is it? What's the format? What's at stake here today? What are the players out here are setting to try to accomplish? That's a good question. What's at stake is points for uh, you know, world's championship qualifiers. Um, first place. Oh, looks like we're heading into game straight Here off. Here we are. Right now, Braden Fraser bringing out the Tornadus and Fluttermane. And uh, Angelo Mor uh, Moral. I can't see. Bring out the Grimmsnarl and the Toxapex. Very interesting. <laughs> Toxapex is generally like a stalling sort of Pokemon. You know, obviously like the Toxic, Grimmsnarl, a very support heavy Pokemon. Looks like they're trying to get some stuff set up just right off rip. Yeah, for sure. The uh, the first two sent out by Angelo. Uh, you always like seeing the Tox specs. It's like a nice, solid defense mon. The stat typing uh, as well kind of allowed to resist some of the more common threatening moves. Maybe not so much against the uh, Fluttermane Moonblast. It's going to do a huge amount to Grimmsnarl. Honestly, I'm surprised it's still slow. Wow. Maybe. That's uh, a major taunt there, too. Yeah, the taunt coming from Tornadus obviously stops Tox Apex from getting off that Toxic. Grimmsnarl did get off that Light Spring, too. That's going to be a huge factor in this one. So looking at the lineups here for both of these players, looks like Brayden went with that Toxpex, Grimmsnarl, and I, he came up a couple other times here. We're seeing the Tornadus, and oh, so that's the targeting type. Uh, I want to see the rest of the Pokemon that he brought for in this first two. And Angela Moral uh, also going with that Tornadus, Fluttermane, possibly the Incineroar, but most likely would have seen that already if they went for that. Um, Raging Bolt could be a huge threat as well coming out here. Really good call, and the Dazzling Gleam and the Storm takes out 
uh, the Grim Snarl. Now, no more screen setters able to come back. <laughs> Toxapex gets the speed drop, even though it's already the slowest Pokemon on the field. <laughs> Yeah, so you lost your Grim Snarl. I mean, it had Light Clay, so that screen's gonna be there for a little bit. I doubt anybody. Maybe someone is bringing uh, the. I mean, you can see the team right now, like Rick Rick. Okay. The, like bringing the uh, the Scizor, got the Roaring Moon in the back end. That's a huge boon to the offense side. You have your Toxic Effect as like a good yeah. like staller tank. Roaring Moon here, that's gonna be the threat to yeah. Angelo's lineup. You can even see the, the zoom out for <laughs> that Roaring Moon. Such a huge Pokemon, and the threat that this Pokemon brings is uh, kind of matching that size here. It's scary so, going into a Flutter main though with the Roaring Moon. It very much is, but you do have the Terra flying. It looks like there we're gonna is. get its rationalization going up right now, probably on. Oh, Yo, on that's the a Flutter Main. Main. That's interesting. Flutter Main going Terra Fairy. Obviously, that's a good choice too. You know, you obviously want to like double the damage output. Um, you want to get rid of the Roaring Moon just right off rip. It's gonna be like the biggest damage dealer for Brady right now. And the Tailwind coming up too. Uh, it if Fluttermain survives this round, I don't remember what HP it's at at the moment, but if it survives this round, this tail- Oh! oh okay! One-shotting the Roaring Moon. It is a fairy type, to be fair, plus the Terrestrialization. Sure. A huge one-shot coming yeah. out. Uh, so, you're losing your real- <laughs> I spent a lot of time hyping up that Roaring Moon. Well, they got a nice yeah, trade, though. Off. Nice little poison jab coming over from Raiden. Ends up taking down the Fluttermain. Nice little one-on-one -on -one trade, but Angelo is in a really good spot right now. Angelo took down, you know, their screen setter, took down, you know, one of their best support Pokemon that they have. Also took down the Roaring Moon, which is their biggest damage dealer. You still have, like, Scizor in the backfield. You know, you have the priority with Bullet Punch um, and stuff. So you still have something, but, I mean, that was still a really great play for Angelo. I feel like uh, I've seen this before. <laughs> Seeing the Landorus and Tornadus, it's, this is a familiar setting from previous generations, but things are a little bit different this time around. Um, I think they might be still running the general. These Pokemon are just solid all around us, right? Seeing this, if you're Brayden, you know, you have an idea of what they might be bringing, but there's always two or three moves that are a little bit of a uh, toss-up of what to expect. We're going to get the Terrasalization coming up now. Going to be on... Scizor, Terra Fire. Fire type as well. So, I mean, still vulnerable to ground type moves uh, from coming up from that Landorus, but uh, going for something here could be really threatening if it lands right. It's not Toss. coming from Toxic Effects, but. Oh, it doesn't really matter. It <laughs> Toxic it doesn't matter. You can't even get the Muddy Water off, anyways. It was gonna go down eventually. I believe this is Brayden's last Pokemon. Yeah. Going for the knockoff on two D Landorus. Life yeah. Orb is gone. It's at a decent HP. No full coverage or like hitting both Pokemon moves here. But honestly, I feel like that that fire typing is such a scary thing to do with against the Landorus. Uh, gonna see how they're gonna play around this one. I think Brayden is just kind of at too much of a like too much of a backflip right now. Exactly. Push too much yeah. against the wall, and it's already over as Landorus is able to pick off uh, pick off the first set. Or sorry, pick off the first game of the set. Yeah, that was just an unlucky Terra type last Pokemon to deal with. That was that was uh, yeah. not great the position to be in. Maybe the Scizor was out first. You maybe play the Steel into the Fairy Terrestrialization, but uh, it just didn't go well for him after that losing Roaring Moon so early. It was like honestly great plays from Angelo. You know, Angelo able to predict the taunt twice onto the Toxic Packs and able to take out their biggest support Pokemon and their biggest damage dealer just right off of Rip. Um, I feel like Angelo played that just almost perfectly. Yeah, he hard read that Toxic Packs going Toxic first, and that kind of just put a big dent to his game plan from then on out. We'll see if the team, team comp changes up after this because. He does have a quite well, a I mean, few we do get to here. watch Brayden sort of, you know, see what he gets <laughs> to bring out. Um, it'll be interesting to see what he tries to change up. You know, with Brayden's team, you still have the Earthworm in the back end. You mm -hmm. still have the Cleavor. Um, honestly, if I'm Brayden, I'm probably, yeah, I was going to say, probably bringing out the Cleavor. I don't know if I want to bring out the Scizor, necessarily. Um, the Scizor does, uh, uh, like, get to help out um, against the Flutter. Um, but it looks like he's opting to go towards the Earthworm. Choosing to go away from Roaring Moon, to me, is a little bit of a questionable move. But still, you know, let's see what the sort of strategy for on Brain and Zen uh, ends up being. All it looks like they're mainly focusing on just getting rid of the Flutter, bringing two Steel Toys. What I'm excited to see here is the fact that bringing up the Cleavor, it is going to be running Tailwind. Uh, so that's offering at least some flexibility when it comes to the Pokemon inside of Brayden's team. Um, it is... 
team, this team on the slower side. So with that Tailwind, you're bringing all that offensive pressure that you get with these bulkier, stronger Pokemon, but you actually get to act first. I feel like that might have been one of the bigger hindrances that I faced in that first round because Angelo Morals, you know, Flutter me notoriously fast. And you can get, off, get away with so many oppressive moves to start off the round. But with the uh, Raging Bolt, with that Thunderclap, and the taunt, oh, it's gonna land taunt on him. Again. Yeah, <laughs> blocking the setup moves off rip. He can't get the tailwind off now, which is what it is. But um, yeah, raging bull coming out with a thunder bull, able to get a Jeez. good chunk of damage oh, and no. the paralysis. <laughs> That's just tough. Unfortunate indeed. So now your cleaver for for lack of a better term, is just kind of out of this one. You know, it's gonna be able to absorb a hit. Most likely not gonna be able to get much else off. But you still have that turn to work with here. You can see Brayden kind of contemplating them out with their options here, seeing what he can go with. But it's going to come out another Bleak Wind Storm, but it's going to miss. Ooh. That is a boon for sure. It, it double wow. misses. Okay. The 70% Bleak Wind Storm double misses. <laughs> Raging Bull still able to get the KO onto Cleavor, so still able to pick off that pick. But that's insane. A that's double miss? I. That's crazy. That is huge. That is huge. Bolt there. Now, what is next pick? It's probably gonna be. I would go Orthworm, but maybe the Scizor is the pick. I was really thinking about this one. Yeah, he's gonna go with yeah. the Orthworm. The Orthworm is the pick. You go Scizor, you know, you don't have the resistance that you do get with Orthworm when comparing to Tornadus. Um, going with Orthworm is definitely the better move here. He's just gonna try and take down this Raging Bolt with the Spirit Break there. Just foregoing the setup right now because he doesn't want to fall for that taunt again. <laughs> we always go for a terrestrialization here. Earthworm. Do as much damage as he can on the Tornadoes here. Earthworm represents, uh, it's, it's a very unique Pokemon. Going for the electric type, uh, which so is works. a great Terra, one we have to say. Great yeah. Terra because you're immune to the ground type attacks that you would be, you know, super effective or weak against. Mm -hmm. uh, as an electric type, you're immune to it and you get healed. So exactly. it, it is a great Terra. For and other than uh, ground type, electric isn't really weak to much else, if anything else. No, it's just just ground. Just ground. Yep. Just ground. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I realized when I was saying, like, is it literally only weak to ground? It so is only weak to this ground. This Orthworm now has no weaknesses and, and will gets absorb. The setup too. Yeah, gets to set up with the coil. So it's just going to oh, be here no. um, uh, accumulating power, but the Raging Bolt is going to survive that Spirit Break. Still low HP, but it, it's still representing a threat. At least it can get the processes off. Still that Raging Bolt can still do some considerable damage before it goes Could down. Could go for a Thunderclap, just to really mess things up, if it, if it is running it. Is it Thunderclap? It is. Yeah, I feel like every Raging Bolt should be running Thunderclap. You know, that's just such a, like, <laughs> it's a dom move. Yeah. dominating move. You know, having that priority is, is obviously pretty good. I feel like we're in a game, a meta game right now where priority is almost on every single team, if not on every single team. Right, right. Now, Orthworm. I, I think, yeah, I think protecting here might be the play because they recognize the Orthworm would be a pretty significant threat. Landorus might not even be able to hit it if I'm going to check its moveless here. But Landorus definitely does have... It has Sludge Bomb at the very least to hit the Orthworm. So you want to try to get rid of it as fast as you can because Sludge Bomb's not going to be too effective against it. But Draco Meteor blocked out. That is a <laughs> huge move. You don't want to get Great hit by play from Brayden. Uh, exactly. From Brayden right there. Going for the Protect. The Bleak Wind Storm is not going to be able to get enough damage to like really matter on the Grim Snarl. And obviously you get the pick, like the pick on... You get the KO, sorry. Um, on one of the <laughs> most... Valorant I'm so used to it. Valorant, like, <laughs> I apologize, everybody. But you get the KO onto the uh, um, Brain Bolt. is not working. Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, which is a very impressive move for sure. And again, look at that—that that protect working so so well there. Orthworm really is kind of that target that you want to get rid of at the moment because now, like I said, that lander is coming in. It had outside of ground move, which would be of course Earth Power. Um, it only has Sludge Bomb to hit. Sludge Bomb not going to be a very scary move. It's not going to get any stab typing. It's not going to be able to get that effectiveness well, off on it. It does get the stab typing because Landorus does have oh, it does the have Terra the poison. poison. Yeah, so if they for sure. do opt okay. for it, they can get that uh, stab typing. But I mean, I guess we'll see what happens. And we'll this Angelo does end up going for it. 
this is the dynamic play that Terra Typing allows you to bring into Pokemon. Exactly. It is such a great mechanic. I think it's probably the most well received mechanic introduced so far in Pokemon. And we are going to get the Terra. And is it going to be on the Landorus? I think it has to be. It's fresh. Yeah. Coming in. It would just be now revealing its Terra Type. We haven't seen it so far, so Brayden probably wouldn't recognize that this would be yeah. a play yet. So the Tailwind is going to be coming out. It's most likely going to be acting first. Uh, so that might be something to worry about if you are Brayden. But the Sludge Bomb coming out now, going on the Grim Snarl. Oh, super effective, really but wins. it's tanky enough to withstand it. Going for the Coil now, like we mentioned, it's going to be able to set up without yeah. any real hindrance. Brayden kind of took that first game, took notes, and is now playing as effectively as possible. Well, gonna go for that spirit break. Poison. It's gonna be get resisted thanks to that poison typing. But what's more important is that special attack is gonna get take a hit for it. Sludge Bomb is gonna be doing even less damage. That is true. And this is the second time that we've seen Orthworm, you know, able to use coil. He's set up twice now. Double attack output. Right, double defense right, right now. And the accuracy, I don't know what moves they're like running to really have that accuracy really help them. But even still, like the double setup on Forthworm is really good and is now gonna be a, a huge threat. That's, this is his sweeper here. He needs to try and keep this or Orthworm up and healthy. We're gonna see the switch out from the Landorus into the Flutter Main. And that Flutter Main is gonna be taking an Iron Tail right to the face soon enough. Yeah, that's really tough. That's a really great read oh, on this part. He sets up the Reflect as well. Brendan Braden for losing his Cleavor so early manages to take it back a little bit. Grimstone goes down, but that's to be expected. Yeah, and with this, um, uh, with this Iron Tail coming out, Earthworm is going to be able to easily pick off. A crit! And a crit! <laughs> Again. Might as well. Yeah. All so right. that's going to be now, I think, are they both down to just one Pokemon each? The two. Two? Each. Okay. We're going to see the Landorus coming back, and then we're going to also see the final Scizor, his Scizor. redemption arc. <laughs> Making a return. <laughs> so honestly, I really, like, the Scizor obviously didn't have much of an impact in that previous game, but I really like it coming out here, because it's just an extra issue to deal with. Scizor represents a huge damage potential if it's left unchecked. And again, this Orthworm's also going to be able to just set up without much resistance. Also going to get that knockoff to reduce the effectiveness coming out from the Life Orb that, that uh, Landorus is holding. So you're going to be doing even less damage. Damage. Plus those spirit breaks, gonna be even less damage. So this Orthworm is gonna be able to continue setting up. This Scissor also potentially gonna be able Jeez. to continue setting up, and that's just gonna be a huge threat that is gonna have to be answered True. at some point. But with that True. Scissor, it's gonna such be a huge to threat that we got flash banged. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So <laughs> massive uh, move. Massive. A little bit of a technical issue. Hopefully, it'll be resolved soon. But while they are sorting all of that out, again, we can kind of speculate as to how that way was going. I would say is definitely Braden was kind of taking charge there with that scissor coming out. Yeah. I really feel like that might have just been checkmate. We're not going to really be able to have an answer. Oh, here we are. We're back. See that coming into play potentially. <laughs> we at least get to see. It. Yeah. Okay. Lander's coming out with the sludge bomb. Uh, oh, is Scizor dead? Did. Is Scizor knocked out? Yeah, they, oh, did the, no. they did find the knockout on the, on the Scizor in Horthworm. Okay, interesting. He takes out the Landorus, though. He's down his last little bit of HP. The thing is, I don't think, though, that he's, he's not gonna A, him. tanky enough, and B, fast enough to yeah, be tailwind able is to still. get um, the Lucky KO so. onto, th like, onto, oh my god, Thunderous. I'm trolling on these names right Tornadus. now. <laughs> <Or> Tornadus. Tornadus. <laughs> yeah. I'm really just this three, trolling yeah. on the names right now. <laughs> I mean, realistically, the only damaging move it has is the Bleak Wind Storm. And the Bleak Wind Storm hasn't been doing too much damage thus far. I think the Earthworm does have a chance to kind of withstand yeah. it. And you do have the accuracy check too. Yeah. Exactly. Seven, which we saw. Accuracy. We can see this go down just to an accuracy check. You know, with the leftovers, yeah. able to get some sort of HP. He might be able to survive this though. Go for the double protect, get a little bit more HP, but he's yeah. just gonna go out yeah. swinging here. And it's gonna come down to this. Oh, it's just barely lives. Huge. Just barely. How much will Wishing this do though? Will this be enough? Here. Okay, so it is coming down <laughs> to final plays. Final plays and the leftovers making a huge impact so far. Uh, which way this is gonna go is gonna remain to be seen. <laughs> it needs to miss. It is gonna come story. down to it either, that. It 80%. either needs to miss or he gets enough HP where he can't get critted. Exactly. I think even though after this leftover, I think he will have enough HP just to be able to survive one. I think. 
it was, potentially. It was potentially. But I think it, it, think it, it just, do you go for the double protect? <laughs> I think you go for it. If you I get the double protect, you'll have you enough. I think you go for it. I don't think you go for the double protect. I think he has enough HP to survive this. I don't think I, he does. I think he'll survive on three. Watch, watch this. Watch. If he survives on three, I'm oh. just, never mind. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay. There is an alternate universe where the double protect play works out and uh, Brain wins the game, but it is a gamble nonetheless. Such a risky play to go out for either way. What As you can see, game. Angelo kind of really Angelo counting. Stress. Lucky there. stars that was able to come out on top there. It really came down to the end there. Really, <laughs> this, this, this is the beauty of Pokemon. You know, it can it can come down to so many different factors. That's how this one ended out. Can't wait to see how the other ones are going to end out as well. Wow, yeah. what an exciting end though. If I, I I feel like you gamble on the double protect when your back's up against the wall, just. Just do the slight chance of you winning, you know? To be fair, <laughs> I feel like the chance of getting that double protect is about the same chance the about Bleak Wind Storm missing True. anyways. Exactly. So either way, it would have just ended up being the same play. It just But, but you either get the protect and it works, or it misses You'd when you miss the protect. doubling up. Exactly. You're doubling up on your thing. Mathematically. <laughs> I think for protect. But to be fair, though, you're correct, because if you go, f if you do survive the damage calculation, and you went for the double protect, and you fail the double protect, which is obviously the most likely outcome, then, well, actually, no, technically it's a 50-50. It feels like the least likely outcome, <laughs> because that's how Pokemon works. If you're unfamiliar, I know we, you made a big point about Bleak Wind having an 80% accuracy check. If yeah, you've never played Pokemon, 80% is not not a lot. <laughs> it's not. It like, feels more you, like 30%. That's why you sometimes see like uh, Pokemon often not running the Rock Slide. Yeah. Rock Slide being you know a spread move, you know high damage calculation, but the 80% accuracy. Sometimes you don't see people going for it. So, exactly. Um, you know, very interesting. Obviously, we saw the one time where it just didn't hit anybody. It double yeah. missed, which is insane, <laughs> insane. But um, talking a bit more about uh, the players. Obviously, Angelo played great, but the way that Braden was able to come back in the second game and mm -hmm. able to make adjustments uh, to what Angelo Incredible. was bringing out, in my opinion, was really great. You know, the Earthworm play, uh, being able to set up the Earthworm and get like you know great damage onto their team, mm -hmm. I thought was a great play. Yeah, I, I, I really, I don't want to just ride your coattails on that, but if we are going to be talking about like the adaptations made through that set, I think that Earthworm. Obviously, you, you brought the Earthworm to the tournament, but recognizing that this was the moment for that Earthworm to be a threat, that that. That takes a lot of uh, game sense and intelligence to really make that play and make it work so well. It's one thing if you throw out the earthworm and it kind of just flops around and wriggles like a worm, but it was a beast <laughs> that had to be dealt with. Yeah, those coils went hard, but just to be a negative Nancy to balance out this positivity, <laughs> that Scizor did not get his time in the limelight. He had a rough time. The type coverage should just not match up against that other team. Mm -hmm. But like uh, we kind of got we, we got into the action really fast <laughs> while we were trying to talk a little bit about more what is happening today. So this tournament and the format of it, what the players are here for, why they're competing. You seem excited for, you know, to talk a little bit more about the format. Again, so the players here are trying to get points to qualify for the World Championships. The top eight, uh, if I'm not sure how many regions we have, but the top eight, for example, first place will have 30 points. Uh, second place will get 16. Um, third and fourth will get 12. But all the players here are going to be competing for the World Championship points. And if you have enough points, by the time things roll around, the championships roll around, you get the invite to it and you get to compete on the grand stage. So there's a lot riding on the line here. You do need 500 points to qualify. For sure. So there are a lot of tournaments that these players will need to play in and win to be able to get these points to qualify for that, you know, said world championship. Um, but, you know, still, 30 points, that can be, like, you know, a make or break. We saw how... Whether you make it in or whether you don't. I believe the margin at the end of that round was 30 HP, you know? Exactly. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> 30 is a large number. Not an accuracy for Pokemon, but uh, it is a large number when it comes to your possibility of qualifying for those world tournaments. And that's what really matters. It's a real grind to get to the top, but you know, all these players are here and they're willing to do it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. When it comes down to such little gambles at the end, <laughs> it's very, very tough to get guaranteed all the way to the top. Even if you bring the best Pokemon, even mm -hmm. if you bring the best possible game plan, sometimes it just comes down to a coin flip. And that's why Pokemon's so fun. Yeah, 
<laughs> I mean, I I I try to avoid as many coin flips as possible. I think that's what the players exactly, are exactly. looking yeah. for. Yes, too. it's not always like that, but sometimes yeah. when it gets down it to it, down you have to, to it. try and math it all out. You make Do you sure. want to double protect? Do you want to try and go for the miss? Mm -hmm. That's what it comes. You want to make sure to. that the coin flip is most likely to land in your favor. <laughs> that's that's the the balancing act of Pokemon. And speaking of balancing acts, mm -hmm. we did also start the day today talking a little bit about what kind of Pokemon we want to see coming out. I think everybody here can tell what my favorite Pokemon is and what Pokemon I'm most interested in seeing. <laughs> uh, maybe one of these three. It's, it's, uh, it's this one. It's, a hint. it's this one. But I don't think anyone is bringing Gengar as uh, Ode was kindly reminding me. It's not that effective. I think it could work. It's you Gengar in the current it. meta, probably not. Cursed body. It, just... Drops, it, it just drops the levitate, which, you know, <laughs> isn't that great. Um, you know, that's why you oftentimes see more people playing Haunter than they do actually yeah. playing Gengar because Haunter still keeps that sense. levitate. Has mm -hmm. about the same special attack, a little bit less on the speed side. It's obviously a lot slower than Gengar is, but at least the damage output is still there. It's, it's very much like a hit or miss, mm -hmm. like bringing in Haunter. But you do see it a lot more than Gengar because Hunter's still able to hold that Eevee Light item, you know, so at least helping it on the bulk side. Mm -hmm. um, but you still don't see it that much. If Hunt, if Gengar did have that levitate, man, it'd be great. It'd be running around and you know destroying tournaments all the time. But. Do you think there are any like sleeper hits that we might be surprised by seeing today? Like anything that might catch us off guard shuckle. if we see some of our next competitors <laughs> getting ready. <laughs> shuckle. Got to do the shuckle setup to baton pass. <laughs> I don't but, uh, even know if that's legal. Like, that's I right. don't know. I don't think you can do it. It's not a very good thing. I was just saying it for the memes. No, but like, honestly. Like, you know what? I did. I was walking around earlier and I saw somebody who, I saw their team sheet. They brought a Sneasler, uh -huh. which you never really see in like any sort of team like format at all. You really never mm -hmm. see Sneasler. Sneasler's like a, like a Smogon OU sort of Pokemon that you bring in a high damage output. Um, not a lot of spread moves, so it doesn't really work too well in terms of devil battles. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be very interested to see how they, you know, end up making that work. Um, obviously, very fast, very strong. Um, so the damage output is, you know, going to be immense. But like I said, not a lot of spread move options, and I don't think they put Rock Slide on it too, which is the only like spread move that they do have. Um, so very interested. I say Sneasler might be a ni nice little sleeper pick. What do you think? Uh, in terms of sleeper picks. I'm not sure what might be the most effective sleeper pick, but the sleeper pick I want to see the most would probably be Mimikyu. I feel like what you can get away with with using Mimikyu, like seriously, especially in VGC, yeah. the just on your first, it's like a, it has a built-in focus sash, kind of. You can sort get of. away with at least using one move, guaranteeing. I mean, unless they focus both of their starting turns to hit your Mimikyu to one-shot it, but then you're set, it's like a built-in follow me as well, mm -hmm. right? If you really want to dedicate the resources to getting rid of the Mimikyu and not let it get set up or maybe and start setting up Trick Room, I think it learns Trick Room, right? It does. Thunder Wave at the very least, which can be really annoying, especially when you're dedicating turns to setting up Tailwind, <laughs> maybe even, well, if you're running Trick Room, you want to get the Paralysis, unless you don't want to get that 20% chance or 25% <laughs> chance to not attack. But in any case, um, I think there's a lot of flexibility. And again, that's the beauty of Pokemon to me, the way you can kind of make anything work out. And I'm excited to see how all these players are going to make their, their team compositions go as far as they can. And uh, speaking of going as far as they can, Owen, you know, like, what are some of these most common strategies that the viewers at home can kind of recognize? And we can bring it up now. So when we start talking about it later on, things that we're going to be, players are going to have to keep in yeah. mind as they're coming in today, what they might have built their teams thinking about. Yeah. So I haven't done a little, like, I haven't didn't study too much of the team sheets yeah, out there. I haven't got didn't to really have much too much either. time. Uh, but just in general, you know, the metagame right now in Regulation F, there's a lot of different things that we can, like, sort of see. There's a lot of priority-heavy teams that you kind of see. Um, mm -hmm. like Entei kind of is very popular. Dragonite is very popular. Um, all the extreme speed users and whatnot. You always have Raging Bolt with Thunderclap. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the electric version of Sucker Punch, when which you in told my opinion me... is a way better move than Sucker Punch. Yeah. Because electric moves cover way more than, like, Dark-type moves do. Um Obviously, like, you still have King Gambit with the Sucker Punch. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, like, priority-heavy teams on that aspect. That you also have a lot of, like, Trick Room teams. Like I said, for Rigorath, I know I keep <laughs> hopping on the Rigorath train. But I'm a, on it, too. Make no mistake. It's just fun. There's a lot of cool, like, Trick Room teams that I've been seeing coming out of the woodworks. There's a lot of, like, Trick Room, Blood Moon, Ursa Luna, Slash, like, Torkoal teams that come mm -hmm. out. What and Torkoal's also a, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, what makes that Blood, Lu Blood Moon, Ursa Luna so powerful for those who don't know? <laughs> One of the highest special attack stats in the game. 
pretty bulky mm -hmm. and has like a point click destroying move Basically. called Blood Moon, which is a 140 base power move. It's With, a special uh, 100 move. 100% accuracy, correct? 100% accuracy, yes. 140 so. damage. And the only drawback is that you can't use the move twice. But you can just use Blood Moon and then use another high power move like at the next turn and then Blood Moon and then the for, next turn. So <laughs> for context, the only other move that kind of works like that or similar in power is Hyper Beam, which you can't act at all. It's a Hyper Beam with turn. less drawback. It's a Hyper Beam, but you can still play the game after you use it. Hyper Beam, the drawback is you don't get to do anything after you use it. But uh, with, uh, with Blood Moon, you still get to play the game. You just don't get to use that move again, which, fair enough. It's a really sure. strong move. Speaking of priority and trick room people, we got the uh, Raging or yeah, raging Pool and the Torkoal coming out just right away. Um, Shen Pao and Amoogus on the side of Connor. Um, interesting to see what we have going on here. Take it away. Yeah, so one thing I do want to mention, again, for those unfamiliar with the newer style this generation brings, so some of these Pokemon, they get a huge benefit from Sun, not just the regular benefit of increase. Oh, as well, maybe a little bit too soon to speak on benefits when your Raging Bolt's going to take such a huge hit to start things off. But with that Weather Ball, oh, it is harsh sunlight. That Chien Pao is going to take a huge hit, going to last with the Focus Sash. So it's a huge thing. And our favorite Pokemon, uh, Owen, we're seeing the Amoongus already going for the Spore. That Raging Bolt is asleep. Not going to be able to go for the Tom Foley for that next turn. But the huge eruption coming out from Torkoal. Going to knock out both of these Pokemon. And I can't even believe how I didn't even consider that. Because both of those Pokemon are weak to fire. Both of them are weak <laughs> to fire. And yeah, like great damage output from Gen Pao. But Gen Pao is just so frail that just one move is obviously just going to like put it in the danger zone. Gen Pao obviously like normally runs the Focus Sash, which allowed it to survive one move. But um, didn't able, wasn't able to survive the eruption for sure. Now we see the Ogre Pond and the Fluttermane coming through. Fluttermane able to get that boost due to the sun. I don't know if it was carrying booster energy. I wasn't paying attention. Um, but... Yeah, we'll see what happens with the Ogre Pong and the Fluttermane. Looks like they're going to Lorasalize the Fluttermane, try and do as much burst damage as they can here. Dazzling Gleam, taking out the Dragon, taking out the Turtle here. Bolt is looking pretty good, but of course we're going to have to wait and see, wait in suspense for this next little Dazzling Gleam to come oh, out here. I can see the, the lights on the, from the TV kind of lighting up. Yeah, let's see if we can space. get the reflection, the reaction. Oh! oh thank okay. you! We're improvising. Thank you, improvising. Yeah, Love nice. it. Yeah, with the, the wiring for this, it, it, I'm not surprised that the, the connection is dropping here and there. Um, very happy that we can still see the action. The Flutter Main, I'm not sure what we want just for right there, but that's probably the Dazzling Gleam. I think the Torkoal might have just protected. Uh, in any case... Still looking at the action up there. Okay, the Ivy Cudgel, again, blocked out. Torkoal is going to last another turn. I think it's still at full HP, so that eruption is still a threat. And throwing out the Fluttermane, again, basically a follow me being called. Uh, you have to do something about this Fluttermane, or you're going to risk uh, a huge uh, amount of damage coming out on your own. Don't you don't want to Yes. Yeah, and the Flutter didn't pop the booster energy. So it might be carrying like choice specs, might be carrying anything to like sort of help that damage output. It got the speed boost from the sun. Um, so even though like, you know, Connor is setting this up pretty well with the Torkoal, you're still getting like a benefit to yourself, you know, having the Flutter come out and getting the boost from the sun too. Yeah. Rasalization gonna come off and get the Terra Fairy off and <laughs> well, we can't see what's going to happen. We don't know what's... <laughs> too powerful of a terrestrialization there. Too powerful of a terrestrialization, but, uh, for sure. We have two of them. There's the Moonblast coming out from the side uh, on that Ogre Pond. Wow, Ogre Pond just barely living there. Oh, with... I thought that was a Focus Sash, but it's, it's just, just going to oh, straight just up survive that. Dazzling Gleam, like That's I mentioned, huge. huge threat, plus the uh, terrestrialization, the Horn Leech. Takes him down. going to actually matter there. I think that is the KO on that Fluttermane. Is it? It is. It is. Yes. Yeah, so that's the KO on the Flutter main, and it's also going to help keep that Orgaporeon up a little bit longer surviving. The eruption isn't going to be as potent as it once was because it has taken quite a little bit of damage here, but it is still going to be enough to knock out the Orgaporeon. Uh, now, with just these two on the field, bringing out the lovely named princess, the Paldea champion. And uh, that's going to be a nice grass type, probably carrying some powder type moves at the very least to bring some threats to this Fluttermane. Definitely also has Solar Blade 2, which, you know, 
really helps out in the sun, but it doesn't look like it's going to do that. Looks like it's going to go for the after you first. Um, and the Torkoal probably going to go for the eruption just yet again. Um, as it does and takes out the Fluttermain. Now, Connor, is it Connor? I can't really tell from the yeah. guy. <laughs> Connor taking the first game of the set. Yeah, that's a great, great gameplay all around. Connor, that Torkoal did a lot of work in this first game. And now we gotta see if he has anything to counter out this Torkoal because he kind of just deleted his whole team and good timing all around from his opponent. It was just a rough game overall. Yeah, so that first one going his way, uh, I feel like the plays around the terrestrialization might have been the real uh, deciding factor in how it kind of went. I'm a lot more interested to see how it's going to go this time around uh, with, again, the first round. Not to say it's all up to random chance, but you are playing a little blind, you know? You have to go in with just a game plan that's not as informed as it can be. And that, like I mentioned before, it's all about setting things up to be as in your favor as possible. And without seeing what sets and everything and what Pokemon are going to be bringing out, what strategies that they might be employing once they are out. Because seeing it on paper is one thing. Literally on paper. Seeing it on paper is one thing. <laughs> but seeing it on the field and how they use that team, what things they're inclined to try doing and try getting away with, is something completely different. So with that first game under their belts, I'm interested to see how they're going to try playing this next one and what strategies they're going to try that. Yeah, uh, it's very interesting. I find it interesting that both of them went for the Flutter main terrestrialization. Of course, it's a very strong, but mm -hmm. it kind of removes your ability to be as flexible with your typing, right? You're just going for that big burst of damage rather yeah. than being a little bit more flexible. I do got to agree with you, especially on the side of... Um, I can't tell the names, but whoever wasn't Connor. Uh, uh, James... <laughs> Who James Maur. James. Well, <laughs> on the side of James, right? You're going up against the Torkoal. I don't believe that the Terra Fairy was maybe the best decision, you know, because then you're just doubling out your damage output on Fairy, but, you know, Torkoal obviously resists that. Yep. Um, so we'll see what kind of happens out here. James gouging fire. changing up the lead, going up with the Lucas and gouging fire. Connor going to stay with the Bull and the Turtle. Hey, it worked last time. It should continue to work this time. Place in this right what are the teams that Connor's going for? Hey, they, they're very on the nose. And full turtle. So that Rasselation going to come out immediately, right away. On to, we don't know. <laughs> It is going to be going onto the Raging Bolt. You can see in the bottom right there, it is a fire type. So, what strategies uh, he's going to be going for? What moves at this Raging Bolt? We not have. We oh, haven't another seen one coming yet. Another Terra though coming. First out turn Terra. First turn Terra is coming out. This one on the, the Amoongus. And it's going to water. Terra water. Good. That's I like a good that. counter. I like that a lot. Um, the real reason this Amoongus didn't really have a lot of effectiveness in the first one because it really just got blown up right at the start you know yeah. with with the water typing now it is going to be able to play a lot more safe and actually get some more spores off than that just the one starting things out weather ball it's not going to be very effective on the raging bulwark it's going to double Still does a lot of damage mistaken, but with that crit yeah uh it's going to do a lot of damage i was really surprised to see it did that yeah. much i was like <laughs> why is it doing this much it's double resisting it <laughs> but bolt is going to be put to sleep the raging bolt uh, so they're going to have some more turns to work with here. But with that eruption coming out, Amoongus is going to resist that very well, as well as the Rage Gouging Fire, and they're going to have some turns to really set things up in their favor. Yeah, he's going to go for the Spore, try and get the double sleep going to buy himself some time. We see ball work coming out from Gouging Fire. Set up for himself here. Let's see what he does. Why the sleep still holds strong. But it's all up to Turtle here. Will he resist the spore? And he does not. He's going to take a little snooze. Mm -hmm. I love Amoongus. Amoongus <laughs> is the best Pokemon of all time. It's pretty good. It's a little <laughs> sus, though. But, uh, so, that's just the nature of Amoongus. Both of your... some of, Honestly, some of your strongest Pokemon are now asleep. Thankfully, they don't really have moves that are quick one-shots to get them out of the field, resisting most of the damaging options that they both have. They're gonna go for the Heat Crash regardless, though. Honestly, not gonna do too much. You're With these sleeps, you're just 
getting more turns to play. These Pokemon will be doing a lot more to you than otherwise. The Grass Knot also going to be resistant. Thanks to that fire typing, probably would have done a lot of damage uh, otherwise. But this seems to be a little bit more of a battle of attrition. Going to go for that sport potentially. No, I think you wreck ass. That's probably not going to work out there. Just going to go for the polygon. Again, they're just taking yeah. these turns to get the damage. Yeah, I, no, no one's really effective against no, each other right exactly. now. So it's no, just I, taking hits. I but feel hey. like the move here, though, especially like it's just a double up on to one specific. Pokemon, right? Like you're trying to spread out the damage too much, and you, again, like you said, all the moves right now, except for like Pink <laughs> Strike, just resist on all sides. So I feel like the damage output is just a double up on one, and you double up on the Torbos, and then you can't come back out and set up the sun later on, um, and then see what happens from there. I am interested though, going for the Pollen Puff to damage instead of healing the Gouging Fire, I think it would have been a little bit more of a longer term to keep your gouging fire up against these two fire types might have been a little bit uh, longer lasting, but opting to just get those chunks of damage. I think that makes sense. I really do respect that. They recognize the situation they're in. It is honestly a battle where even just one point of damage is going to kind of like sway the tide of battle. Another spore is going to go up on Turtle here, <laughs> Torkoal, uh, <laughs> recognizing that it is a pretty significant threat if left unchecked. But now that it's asleep, it is going to be not much of a threat regardless. Yeah, James really taking the time to like stall his turns out, like just right away. And now the Protosynthesis boost gets uh, put onto the Gouging Fire uh, with the booster energy, now that the Sun uh, is deactivated. Um, so still has that attack boost um, onto the Raging Bull, uh, which is, you know, definitely good. Definitely helps with the damage spread. Um, but yeah. But now we're seeing what more both of these trainers want to go for. Switching up, the, switching up the Torkoal. Honestly, kind of forgot that was an option. <laughs> Recognizing now that these are still just the first two Pokemon that both of the gentlemen are bringing to the battle here. Connor's gonna go for the Flutter Main. Gonna go for that Breaking Swipe. Obviously, not gonna affect the Flutter Main thanks to the Fairy typing. The Thunderbolt coming out now onto the Amoongus. I. Again, yeah. it's a fire type right now, but I forgot it's an electric type by nature, so it is going to have the coverage options on that Amoongus. It's been asleep for most of this battle, but now that it's awake, it can finally get rid of that threat. And Connor making the change, uh, initially went with Thunderclap last turn, but then decided, like, realized, hey, Thunderclap's not going to work, especially if I'm just scoring you 24-7. <laughs> and it's not going to work if he doesn't target you, too. So opting for the Thunderbolt was a great, like, change-up for Connor there, for sure. Um, now the Chen Pao coming out, the uh, Fluttermane, obviously out now. Um, Fluttermane is really a good pick to bring out here. Um, you know, obviously resist double against the gouging fire, but then comes back out. I'm assuming the Torkoal is going to come back out now just to set a fire. Yeah, obviously probably a good play just to get the fire up, even though Torkoal's probably going to like die off this turn. It gets the Protosynthesis boost for Raging Bull and also for the Fluttermain when Fluttermain does eventually come back out too. Oh, Thunderclap is going to be making its debut in this battle. It's going to do a huge chunk into the Chen Pao. Oh, no. Ice Spinner is going to be so heavily resistant, it's not even going to be able to take out the Torkoal. Oh, and no! Well, <laughs> just barely taking Bolt down. Now, you got to go for that Sucker Punch. I really think that's the only real option that makes sense here. The Chen Pao is so low. You have to try to get something out of it before it's going to go down. And getting the Raging Bolt out of the battle might be one of the most effective options. And it's, that's exactly what it's going to accomplish. Taking down the, the Raging Bolt finally out of this battle is a huge threat eliminated. Yeah, that's very true. He's obviously going to find the Megalons of the Torchal as well with a great swipe. And now Connor is left with two. Pretty sure, right? Just Fluttermane and whatever he has on the back line. Exactly. And we're going to be making uh, that. We're, it's going to be making the debut just now. So it's going to be that Fluttermane. And what else brought the Sweden Lilligans? The yes. Lilligan comes back out too. I'm, I'm impartial to the Lilligans. Uh, not the Hisui form. I really like the base a lot of the game. Always try to make sure I can fit that into some of my teams. I think True. what that Pokemon brings, it is the standard grass type support. Um, allows you to get some helpful moves, maybe even get some sun set up. Benefits a lot from sun. Uh, and obviously just the standard grass type moves like Sleep Powder making this. <laughs> that was the one at the top of my mind. And it's going to be coming out, going right on the Gouging Fire. And that's going to be 
another huge threat put on the back burner. But the Dazzling Gleam, the Dragon Typing of that Gouging Fire is going to be coming into play and not the way that James is going to want it to. Going to make it weaker to that and it is going to go down now. Uh, no amount of Pollen Puffs would make that work for you. So Flutter made now the last Pokemon for James coming out and it's looking to be going Connor's way so far. No terrestrialization. There's nothing you can do to gain an edge in this battle. It's a Fluttermane versus a Fluttermane and Princess the Lilligan. It's not looking to go yeah. the way of James this time. But, uh, and yeah, the Solar Blade coming out here makes the most sense. You know, you obviously just want to double up on the attack. You don't want to just focus too much on supporting the Fluttermane. The Solar Blade is also a super high damage. <laughs> yeah, just one shots Fluttermane instantly. Connor able to pick up, take off the second game, able to take the set to a very good clean set. Connor there played very well, very cleanly. And I'm excited to see what our next matchup is going to be. I'm just flabbergasted with how strong that this Raging Bolt is in. We've seen it on two teams now. Yeah. I knew it was strong. I didn't know it was going to be this strong. I can't say I'm surprised, um, <laughs> especially Owen and I, we kind of brainstormed a little bit uh, yesterday and came to a lot of conclusions, our thoughts on the Pokemon that people are most likely going to be bringing, and Raging Bolt was definitely up there. We saw how effective that Thunderclap was. Obviously, we talked a little bit about, as well, how Chien Pao is a bit of a glass cannon, most like most ice types, honestly, mm -hmm. but still, just instantly taking out a threat, didn't go down, but for all intents and purposes went down and being able to continue doing things like that. If it was still an electric type instead of a uh, fire type, Chan Pao would have been insta-KO'd. Insta insta it was a fire type, so it's not going to get that stab bonus. In any case, again, my main point, Raging Bolt is such a huge threat. And well, I mean, either way, Chan Pao was going to be running Focus Sash anyways. Like, exactly. It does on every single Chan Pao set. I don't think <laughs> I've ever true. seen a Chan Pao set that doesn't run Focus Sash just because of how frail uh, Chen Pao is. Um, but it's still got it in the same range as Focus Sash would anyways. I mean, exactly. it's at 10 HP by the time, like, Thunderclap went and then if That's Chen still Pao... great damage output for a priority move, we gotta say. If it went for anything outside of Sucker Punch, then it wouldn't have been able to do anything before getting KO'd by Thunderclap, mm -hmm. regardless. So, it really <laughs> is just a huge limiter on some certain Pokemon, uh, and it forces Raging Bolt to kind of be the center of the battle as long as it's on the field, without even needing to use Rage Powder or Follow Me. Yeah. And uh, honestly, I think like the real unspoken hero from this game was Torkoal, especially oh. in the first game. Torkoal Im immediately just swept, swept the entire team. It had nothing to do with anything tarot-wise. Torkoal just came out, set up the sun, and was like, okay, cool, I'm spamming Eruption, and I'm winning the game. <laughs> and just swept the entire team. And it's a good strategy, yeah. too. That's why oftentimes yeah. you see Torkoal coming out with the, guess what? Rigoraf setting up Trick Room and getting the speed bo boost. But, you know, Torkoal not opting for that and, you know, just playing off of a purely sun-based team. I thought it was a great play from Connor. Yeah, I, I think that... I, w what I'm starting to understand about some of the higher level competitive Pokemon battling is the more unsuspecting a Pokemon is, the better. Because when you see Raging Bolt, you're like, I need to get rid of this thing now. <laughs> so you're dedicating all your resources to getting rid of it. Meanwhile, yeah. Torkoal is packing, what is it, base 120 power, fire type move. You don't, I think it's 150. 150. Eruption is 150 yes. unless you get HP drops, but mm -hmm. it still has... Uh, heat wave. I'm pretty sure yes, on exactly. the back line. Like you have oftentimes see heat wave coming out too, which is still like high damage output. Um, still a spread move, which is good. It does have a little bit less accuracy, but like 150 base power if you're at full HP. And Torque was at full HP for the entire first game, so exactly. it was just 150 like 150 to power for the entire time. Yeah, and there's just not much you can do about it. Cause it's a catch. It's a catch 52 because either you get rid of 52. Is it 22? Yes, 22. 22. It's 22. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a we're on the advanced era. Okay, 52 is more than 22. If that's how significant of a catch 22 it is. Mm -hmm. It's 30 more. 30, 30 more catches. More. 30 more like catches. 62. <laughs> exactly. We're gonna keep going higher. Because either you go for the torque and you get Raging Bolt just doing whatever it wants, or you dedicate your resources to taking down a Torkoal that ends up not mattering too much. So at some point, you have to make a decision, and that decision's not going to go in your favor. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a tough decision to make, you know? You, the Torkoal's really strong when left unchecked, but I feel like it's not strong enough that you want to just focus your entire team to exactly. take down this Torkoal. So it's a really 
Like you said, catch 52. <laughs> catch catch 151, maybe. I'm not going to live that down, <laughs> am I? No, not really. But, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. no, go ahead. What are you saying? I, I was going to kind of go back into like the sort of team building uh, side of things. Mm. Connor played like and built his team perfectly around Sun. You know, bringing the Hisui and Lilligant, which has Solar Blade. That's which, what I was going to say. Again, I great. Oh, you were about to say that? It's not exactly, but I'll get to my point when you're done. Oh, okay. Go ahead. My, go ahead. my apologies. No, no. But again, like the Solar Blade, great damage output, but also has a bunch of supporting moves too that mm -hmm. I can bring to the table to help out the Flutter Mane, to help out uh, the uh, Raging Bolt, you know, to help out the Torkoal as well. Um, so it, it's obviously like built around support, but has that great damage output that a lot of support Pokemon don't have. Torkoal, again, basically only comes out because of the fact that it can set up Sun. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, when Maridon and Crydon are legal, <laughs> it's never going to be a, like, Torkoal will never be a Pokemon that will be used when that form, like, format comes out. You know, obviously, because <laughs> both, like, uh, was it Coridon can set up Sun, but like you know, just the simple fact that it can set up Sun and has that great damaging output, uh, obviously amazing. And with the Terra Fire, you know, it just built perfectly. I thought you did a great job, like with the team building. Yeah, and uh, the point I was going to bring up was the fact that Sun is such a significant thing to consider in this meta, I think that allows for a lot of different strategies to come into play. It's not even revolving around Sun necessarily, revolving around suppressing Sun. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, <laughs> hey, hate on me all you want. I think it's time we see the return of blizzards, okay? Or uh, ice storms, because... Yeah. Hail. Uh, hail. <laughs> there I we go. I think it's snow now. I don't even it's think snow? There's, I don't even there's think snow? there's hail. I keep changing. Oh, it doesn't damage anymore, right? No, it doesn't oh, damage, it doesn't, but it boosts, right. like, uh, ice-type attacks. I think it would be better if it uh, boosted Ice Type Defense. <laughs> you still see it, I think, with, uh, what is it, Galarian Slow King or something like that? With, like, so, Chili yeah. Reception. I believe that's what it is. I think it's Galarian mm. Slow King with the Chili Reception. So it's basically, like, um, sets up snow, but also is, like, a U-turn sort of thing. Doesn't do any damage, gotcha. but sets up the snow and then gets out. Kind of like I've how Parting that. Shot does with, like, you know, the attack and special attack drops. Um, but just with, like, setting up snow, and then it, it's all, like, pivots into other Pokemon. And it's yeah. also slower, too, so it just ends up being a free pivot for most ice types. So, if you are playing, and, and that's, the, the, the weather metas have always been a sensitive issue, because when the weather is too strong, too powerful, it becomes really oppressive to other strategies. But since it is so, honestly, you, you could really build your team not utilizing sun at all, but if you really don't, like it, you're kind of missing out on the opportunity to. And again, this is the the breadth of Pokemon. This is the the wealth of strategy that you can kind of bring into play. You can decide how you want to bring it, what kind of flexibility you want, whether you want to go all in on the sun, whether or not you want to spec in maybe one guy on your <laughs> six, because you only bring in four, right? You can have one guy of your six that can work well with sun, but can ignore it. Or you could go all in on completely destroying sun, bringing in rain, bringing in snow, maybe even just some terrains to really mess with them, Bring in Sandstorm if you really want, right? <laughs> and just completely shut down any Sun-type strategies. And I'm curious to see what kind of other weather strategies we're going to be seeing today. Because just off the top of my head, right, you know, right, rain, obvious counter to the Sun. It reduces the power of Fire-type moves and obviously boosts the power of Water-type attackers, which would then further negate the power of Fire-type Pokemon. But Sun isn't powerful necessarily for the fire type pokemon it is more for the paradox forms so whether or not you're going to be focusing anti-fire or if you're going to be focusing anti uh paradox form pokemon that's the decision you're gonna have to make but i think rain is a very valid option to bring to the table for this meta yeah. maybe you disagree obviously no i i agree for sure especially with our caladon in the meta now too mm -hmm. with electroshot you know not having that drawback of having to charge electroshot and just being able yeah. to get that special attack boost and the 130 damage just on just immediately mm -hmm. rain is obviously going to be a big thing i did see a rain team already really uh, while looking through team sheets it was the first team sheet i looked at was it was the, the one first guy that came on in pardon was the one with the sneezer on it it was the one with the sneezer on it. It was the same team. <laughs> now I'm really scratching my head. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting strategy this guy brought out. I, I was very confused, but I was mm. like, I'm, I'm very interested to see how it does work out. I hope he does make the top cut too, so then we can see some of those sort of games. But, you know, Rain is very prominent. Obviously, like I said, with our Kaladin, who's now become a mainstay in the Regulation F format. Obviously, Sun works really well with uh, Protosynthesis and the Paradox Pokemon. You obviously see Grassy Terrain with Rillaboom. Rillaboom's on a ton of teams. So you're going to see that Grassy Terrain come out. Mm -hmm. Electric Terrain, maybe, sometimes, you know, with a future uh, Paradox Pokemon that does help out a little bit. There's not very many good Electric Terrain setters, though, at all in the mm -hmm. game right now. Obviously, when Maridon is available, <laughs> it's just going to dominate, set up Electric Terrain, and then Paradox, Paradox. But... 
as of right now, there's not very many, t like too many good electric train users. That brain blast I just had was mm -hmm. in relation to how electric train interacts with sleep. Uh, I feel like that whole interaction we had that game would have been completely nullified if one of those uh, trainers went with maybe an electric train tread up instead of drought. I can't wait until Maradon's legal because <laughs> no Amoongus. I despise Amoongus. <laughs> Double sleep is so annoying. I it can't. Is. I can't stand it. Um, can't stand sleep powder. What's that actually? Seventy five. Something like that, right? Uh, it's either 75 or 80, I think. 80? I'm not sure. Keep in mind, Spore has a 100% accuracy, so whatever you click it on is going to fall asleep. And Amoongus, honestly, is such a tanky Pokemon. Like, even getting hit by fire moves might not even be that much of a downside for it. It can survive quite well, a lot of Well, it's pretty things. much a downside. Yeah. <laughs> getting hit by a super effective... I didn't say kinda, it. I didn't say it's not a, a little bit. I said it will hurt, but honestly, it's not going to always die. That's my mm -hmm. point. It's not yeah. guaranteed that if you hit this thing with Flamethrower, it's going to to die yeah which it does have enough bulk where it can survive like exactly or it might survive like a heat crash maybe <laughs> will it survive a 150 base power eruption from a full hp torkoal no as we saw no as we saw no no <laughs> but the fact that you have to actually commit that much to get that confidence of putting the Amoongus down mm -hmm. is strong enough regardless. Snow does boost the defense, actually, and not really? the attack. Really? The defense. Looking, yeah, it boosts the defense according to a Twitch shatter. So there we go. We have a little bit of an update. So <laughs> you, you stand corrected. Thanks, Danu. Black Dragon, for the correction. Yes, we appreciate thank you very it. much. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, while, like I mentioned, the weather strategies are being such a huge part of this meta, and I'm excited to see how the trainers kind of develop that, and even develop it through the tournament. Although you have your team set, the way you play it might change based off of the strategies that you're seeing other trainers employing. And we already saw how that can manifest just based off of those two matches we just watched. They had the same Pokemon on their teams, but they played it and it ended up so differently. So I'm excited to see how all the other trainers who have the benefit of being able to watch these games mm -hmm. might even change their own strategies going into their next ones. Yeah, and I'm curious as to why... He picked Terra Fire on the Raging Bolt. I guess it's to counter the ice weakness, right? But does he have any fire type moves? Was he running any type fire type moves? I don't moves? think so. I think it might have just been a defensive type. I think it was just it could defensive have just been a typing. Defensive yeah. typing. Yeah. Also, gets rid of the dragon weakness that. Oh, like, that's true. Uh, gouging fire would have you know been able to output onto Raging mm -hmm. Bolt. Um, I, yeah, like I said, like. it could have helped out in the sun with a Terra if it does have like a fire move. I don't know if it, it had did. a Weather Ball. Oh, I that was what it was running. It was running yeah, weather ball. That's yes. true. Yeah. It's helped. just that we didn't see it. And it hit the crit, the too. Water type. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We didn't really, like, pay too much attention. But, yeah, weather ball, I guess it helps out, for, like, a lot. But uh, we'll see. It looks like we're, like, getting close to heading into the yeah, next maybe game. maybe two or three more minutes maybe until we get into the next minutes, one. We're getting sort of there. Yeah. Um, what are you sort of looking towards in this next game like what sort of strategies have you not seen mm. or have you seen that you feel are going to be prominent in i want to see some substitutors i'm ready oh, to God. see some substitutes i don't know why that came to me so strong <laughs> i really want to see any shed tail users any sub i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna rage <laughs> i love i listen you, okay you like vgc a lot i like singles a lot as well and that's where my love for substitute kind of comes into play because nothing feels better for me when i bring out my mimikyu and i substitute and i know <laughs> my opponent's gonna have to not only break my substitute but then hit me again and then i get another substitute for free and i'm doing nothing the whole time i'm not even really getting to hit them but it's just funny i, I really like setting that up mimikyu also if i could put mimikyu on my shirt i probably would yeah but you know it, it, not enough space here with all these swirls and gengars ghastlies and haunters but in any case um i really want to see some substitute strategy in vgc it is a little iffy because with Again, singles, just two Pokemon on the mm -hmm. field. One hits there, one hits there. But with <laughs> literally so, just do something s as simple as adding two more on the field makes so many strategies kind of completely unviable or not unviable, but just a lot more risky, yeah. a lot less safe. Um, not so, only that, but the amount of Pokemon that you're allowed to bring two. Exactly. Right? Because obviously you, you bring six and you go in with four in like VGC formats, whereas like singles, like you're talking about like, oh, you like Smogon sort of uh, formats, you bring all six and you mm -hmm. use all six. So dedicating one Pokemon or one turn to like using uh, Substitute isn't as much of a drawback as you mentioned as using it in like a 4v4 like meta mm -hmm. where like if you're just dedicating Substitute and then on just one Pokemon, it's like a 3v5, you're already at a back foot. Exactly. And then it cuts the HP in half. And when you're out of that Substitute, it's... 
not looking pretty for you when you're looking down earthquakes <laughs> yeah. and and uh, rock slides. Well, maybe not rock slide, but other very effective uh, sweeping coverage moves. I but, do think, though, that we can see maybe some if we have, like, a slow shed tail user. Like, Orthworm can, like, you know, probably set yeah. it up, too. Yeah. Um, I can see uh, that. Sceptile's probably not slow enough. Or tanky get, enough. Or, yeah. To you, get, you, like, unfortunately, like, that's the nature of Substitute or Shed Tail. You, you want your, your user of it to be tanky. Uh, so they can kind of withstand all the pressure that only comes from cutting their HP in half. But, of course, they're going to be taking damage at some point. But as we're getting into this next battle, we're seeing two Lilligans already on the field. The Torkoal and a Landorus. We're seeing Brantley and Silas on the battlefield, and these trainers are looking ready to show what they're made of. Starting off with the eruption, so Protect's already out. We have Lilligant already taking a huge amount of damage. We're gonna stick through it with the Focus Slash. Just curious to see what moves he's gonna retaliate with. Sleep Powder onto the Torkoal. I love that. I think that was a great play from Silas there, going with the Sleep Powder on Torkoal. We've seen how useful and how like high damage that like Torkoal can be you know, how much of a threat it is to pick up on those KOs. So getting the Sleep Powder off on the Torkoal is obviously a huge play. Brantley gonna pop him to pull out from the Torkoal, and Rain King Gamut, which might be maybe a little bit of a misplay, but we'll see what happens going forward. You have the close combat with the Silas, um, with Silas's uh, Lilligan and stuff like that. Um, a little bit weak to the Landorus. Oh no. So we'll see, and we're going for the double Sleep Powder. Okay. That's a great play on Brantley's part, because now they get rid <laughs> of uh, at least one of the weaknesses uh, for the King Gambit. And I really, okay, you, you went down a couple tangents that I really appreciate and brought up and make my point a lot stronger here. The the, the the power of that Sleep Powder was so effective because you have your Lilligan on the field, which is running Solar Blade. Do you really want to run a Solar Blade into a 1 HP Lilligan? No, right? <laughs> so you're basically telling your opponent, you need to do something here and I want to see what you can do. You're forcing your opponent to re uh, reveal more of their moveset and now, and you Obviously, it's going to go for the Solar Blade this time, whether it's going to be on the Landers or the Lilligan. It's going to be on the Lilligan. It is on the Lilligan. Wow. Even though you said that, they still go for the Lilligan. But that's the thing. It guarantees the KO, though. It is going to be a huge move. You wish you could use it on the Landers, but it is going to resist, or it is going to be at least neutral. It's probably not going to guarantee the kill, and you don't want to be taking unnecessary wow. things like that. And it is going to be asleep. So... I think that sleep in response, long story short, the sleep into the sleep was a giant brain play by both players. <laughs> <laughs> Brantley came in with the King Gambit, which could have been risky, but played it so well with the sleep powder. Honestly, a great play on their part. Kind of waiting to see what happens on here. If the, like, the landers can wake oh. up, gets. It's a very, very good play. Good sucker punch there, taking out the landers. But with all that said, we're going to see a Weather Ball come out, and that's going to be disastrous for the King Gambit. He's going to go down there. Now it's getting dicey here. Let's see. I'm going to switch back into the Torkoal, but unfortunately. Well, that's actually an enemy Torkoal. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was the Torkoal other team, but session. no. Torkoal we're going to have two Torkoals. You know, we got a lot of Sun teams in this tournament. I used to really great to see, which is honestly fair with the Protosynthesis, you know, with all of the really prominent um, Paradox Pokemon in the meta right now. So, Torkoal coming out, gonna have that, you know, damage output with Eruption, opting to go for Earth Power. We'll see what shakes up here as we're getting a Terrestrialization going on. On. Somebody. Somebody. <laughs> the terrestrializations are such a huge too powerful. impact. And we're going to see it is going to be a fire type terrestrialization on the Raging Bolt. Another common, I guess we've already seen two of it. I'm confident enough to call that a common set now. Uh, and I think it makes sense. The defensive typing, fire not usually seen as a defensive typing. Um, but in this context, in this meta, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's going to go to opt to take down the Lilligant, which is going to be one less sleep user for us to all worry about. And with both of these trainers at a 1-1 one, one record, they really both want a win here to kind of set themselves up for success. So, that Dragon Beam is going to go off. It's going to be a decent amount of damage. Again, Fire-type getting rid of that Dragon-type weakness. So, you're going to have the benefit of that, not needing to worry about it, but going to be sending up someone here. Another Torkoal. <laughs> Already Sunlight out, so... 
not going to be uh, too much of an effect there. But now you have another portal to worry about, and we're seeing duplicate yeah, sets now. It's the exact like, same comp. It's, exactly. it's the exact same <laughs> right now. The Torkoal coming out obviously helps out all Pokemon. The Sun just worn out, so you know, it does benefit both Raging Bolt. But both Torkoals are asleep. Right? It's kind of really we're at the oh, game. I even know we're it's playing. The same. Who wakes up first? Or uh, unless like, you know, Silas can take out their Raging Bolt um, or, you know, whatever happens. Um, we'll kind of have to wait and see. But honestly, I think the game is just going to be what Torkoal can wake up first. I think going, uh, I think this might be, yeah, the Torkoal acting, which is just sleep, so it's not going to be awake yet. Uh, you really want that Earth Power now, both players do, because it's going to be effective against the Grass and the Fire typing. But that Dragon Moon is going to be doing such a huge amount of damage to that Torkoal. Not going to use any kind of Terrestrialization, so that Dragon Moon is going to be effective on the Raging Bolt. Torkoal, now let's sleep. And one oh. of them waking up here. The one with the Earth Power is going to go off and take down Brantley's Raging Bolt. You can see the frustration there. I would be frustrated as well. Raging Bolt is such a huge Pokemon for your strategy. Yeah. Now you have to play without it. It's not going to be very easy to do. But that's the beauty of Pokemon. Again, all these trainers here are going to have to work their best to make the strategies work out, no matter what happens. Toko woke up, though. It was honestly just a coin flip to sort of see, like I said, who woke up first. Silas's Torkoal did end up waking up first, so they were able to get the uh, get the knockout on the Raging Bull and eventually get the knockout on the Torkoal. Silas going to pick up the first game of the set. We'll see where we go heading into game two. Yeah, it was interesting that they had pretty much the same comp. We get, didn't get to see if Silas had the King Gambit as well, but it was pretty <laughs> was much the exact good. same team pretty from much. what we saw. <laughs> yeah, you had the Lilligant, the Torkoal, oh, the, the Raging yes. Bull. You didn't get to see the back end of like what they actually had. Yes. But yeah, for the most part, it was just a mere comp. <laughs> yeah, so we're seeing these sunny day comps just dominating this meta, at least in this tournament so far. Yeah. Yeah, Drought Torkoal has honestly been like a mainstay in a lot of different teams. Like mm -hmm. I said, with the uh, um, what's it called? All the good Paradox Mons, all the good sorry past Paradox Mons that um, you know play into like Sun teams really well. And there's a bunch of them that are like super prominent right now, like Raging Bolt being extremely bulky, extremely strong, having priority, and getting the boost from Sun too. Exactly, insane. The thing, the fact that the Dragon Beam full HP and it hit the Raging Bolt, and I think it took, what, to like 40%? That's... It took it took about like 60%, which is exactly. still a good chunk, but that's like... That's what I'm saying. Like that's that's should have, that, should have, that should have knocked out. Yeah. Because <laughs> no, Raging Bolt has a lot of special attack, and it's that's not a negligible amount of damage to withstand. So even using moves that are super effective against a Pokemon, it is going to withstand them. Again, from Pokemon that have a huge amount of special attack, it's still able to withstand them. So Raging Bolt maybe a little too tanky for the power that it brings, but I think that's why we're seeing so many trainers bringing it to this event. And like the little Lilligan plushie. Yeah, on the yeah, yeah, I like oh, that too. <laughs> Came out prepared. Mm -hmm. So now that we know that we're just going all Sun teams, what would you guys do to counter this if you had this information going forward? Is there any counterplay to this, or is this just kind of rolling through Chlorophyll. any other team comp? You still have like the other setters too. Like if you have a rain team, like mm -hmm. sometimes you'll see rain teams come out. But honestly, I think the play is just to play into like sun mm -hmm. teams have pokemon in the back line that you don't plan on bringing out if that's like your case if your strategy isn't playing into you know a sun team have pokemon that you can bring that do play well into the sun teams right obviously you see a bunch of flutter mains on a bunch of teams and you don't need flutter mains to be going into uh what's it called in sun teams and whatnot yes. just a function but again does play yeah, it in very well um speaking yeah, of we'll see what happens armor rouge and indeedy Coming out first, getting the Psychic Train set up. This is an old, old duo that we used to see back in, like, Regulation, like, 1, like, Regulation A and B. Uh, it's very interesting to see Armor Rouge and Aditi come out right now. Yeah, one thing I was going to say about how you play around Fire or Sun Team is, at least the old uh, wisdom is... You have to sacrifice some resources to, oh, the following gonna come out. It's gonna redirect the Sleep Powder onto the NDD. Might be what you're expecting, but obviously you don't want that Sleep Powder to land. You'd be a lot happier if it ended up missing, but not gonna go your way. Plus the Thunderbolt, but that's all space for your Armor Rouge to use the Trick Room. There we go. That, I mean, you've been talking about Trick Room all day today. We're gonna get to see the effectiveness that can bring, but like I was mentioning just a little bit ago, you know, the, the benefit of knowing that your opponents are going to be bringing, uh, you know, Sunny Day or Drought to 
the uh, battlefield is that you don't have to sacrifice the resources to get this out of yourself. You can just bring Pokemon that benefit from it. And I was thinking, you know, Pokemon with Fire Absorb or moves that allow you to capitalize off of Sun and, you know, play into Fire-type Pokemon like the Torkoal. Armor Rouge, probably one of the best for I believe this one even does have Fire Absorb, so any eruptions coming out would just be healing it. Yeah, and you're still going to see the Torkoal come out too. Armor Rouge obviously plays very well with the Torkoal, but I feel like the Torkoal coming out benefits Silas more than it does benefit Brantley. We'll see, the Meteor Beam comes off uh, for Brantley. It's going to charge, give him a special attack boost. Yeah, he's relieved. And he has the Power Herb, so he doesn't have to play it. It's earned. It comes straight through. It only does that. See. This is what I mean. It's <laughs> such a tanky Pokemon that only t it doesn't even take half. It doesn't even take half of the damage. And he's put to sleep. That the dragon typing allowing it to resist as well. Fire, uh, so it's going to play a factor there. But even so, with that resistance, it is going to do a huge chunk of damage, all things considered. Your armor rouge, it is running flash fire, so that would have been something you could play around before. Now you don't really get the chance to. It's asleep and low HP. It's really going to struggle going forward here, bringing out the King Gambit with the Eruption follow-up from the Torkoal. It is going to pop the Focus Sash onto the Lilligant and take down the Raging Bolt just a little bit more. Yeah, it's a good damage output right there. Silas is going to pop off with the Dragon Balls and so. The attack, that's pretty lucky there. Options here. They're really trying to take down this King Gambit, as I know he's doing so much damage here. He has the moves to counter him as well, the Weather Ball and the close combat. King Gambit's in a very dicey spot. Oh, the Heat Wave, like you mentioned, going to be effective. It's at least going to get some a little bit of petty damage onto the Raging Bolt. Going to get that burn too. Um, special attacker primarily, so it's not going to affect it too much, but at least going to be taking some damage per turn, which is always a benefit. Gal Top Leaf coming out now. Just going to try to knock out the Raging Bolt, and it's going to yeah. succeed there. Even though the Armor Rouge is going to be taking quite a lot of damage, and so is the Torkoal, ultimately Brantley is going to be winning, winning this first interaction. Silas now going to have to answer with the Flutter Main and Landorus. Yeah, and oftentimes you'll see the King Gambit go for the Sucker Punch there. Obviously with both Pokemon like at low HP, you know, you want to go for the priority. But with Trick Room set up and both of their Pokemon being so slow, a lot slower than, you know, uh, Silas's Pokemon are in comparison, it was really a great play to not go for the Sucker Punch. You know, it shows that Brantley is able to adapt to whatever strategies are in play. Um, seeing as the Fluttermane and the Lander has come in, probably going for the Dazzling Gleam. Yeah, like I said, to spread the damage. Torkoal is at a low enough HP level where the Dazzling Gleam might be able to pick up uh, or like get the KO. Um, but we'll see, the Protect comes from the Landorus. Good protect here. It helps it. The Heat Wave comes through. Landorus isn't going to be able to take any damage there, but it's going to probably be a good chunk of damage onto the Flutter Main going to the low half. The Kowtow Cleave comes and gets the Ooh. KO onto the Flutter Main. Now it's just Landorus by himself on an island. But Trick Room is done. We're over with Trick Room, you know? Maybe we're able That's to get true. something with Sandseer Storm. <laughs> you never know. We might see as long as it hits both. Oh, it gets a Sucker Punch, punch off, through, though. It gets a ton of damage. Now it needs to hit both in order for it to work. And Jeez. Silas gets the double knockout onto Torkoal and King Gambit. Even it's an amazing that. play and amazing read from them, for sure. <laughs> Basically now, with, again, with that Armor Rouge being so low and asleep, it is going to kind of come down to just a one-on-one -on -one here. Uh, with Landorus having a huge sweeping move here, as we just saw that Sandseer Storm, super effective. Hopefully the last indeedy now against the Landorus. Can it take down this Landorus? It's it is at less than half HP. I'm sure it can be pulled off, but the indeedy asleep as well. Forgot that myself. So at very least one free turn. Going for the Earth Power potentially. Yeah, it's gonna guarantee to take down the Armor Rouge because if this indeedy is gonna be the only Pokemon up. I think it's pretty confident that Silas will be able to handle it with the Landorus. This Indeedee most likely doesn't have anything too powerful. Plus, it is going to be asleep for one more turn. The sleep moves guaranteeing at least two turns of sleep. 
keeping oh, track. Terrestrialization. Oh, but the terrestrialization. Yeah, will it be able to resist this next move? Is it going to be a what flying type? Is Indeedy going fairy? for it right here? Going for fairy. the fairy okay. terrestrialization, which isn't going to help too much on the defensive right. end, but can help with the damage output if Indeedy wakes up here. But no. isn't going to be able to get no. the chance. Indeedy gets knocked out, and that's just it. That's the set. Take Silas, taking it 2 0. Yeah, very, very <laughs> well played by both trainers there. You can see the companion. It's a wholesome moment right yeah, there. Yeah, love it. And again, that's another huge benefit of Pokemon, allowing all kinds of trainers from all ages to show off their skill and bring everything to the field. So love to see the competition here today. And both trainers really brought their 100%. Yeah, Brantley had some really competitive strats there in the second Honestly. game, but that Landorus is just a little bit too strong there in the end. But it was a very good set. To watch all the way through. Yeah, mm -hmm. Brantley's like a prodigy in the making, right? The kid is like no, <laughs> like too. older than ten years old, and like <laughs> already has like amazing strats to come out. Had great adjustments going into the second game, mm -hmm. um, and almost you know like really won the game, right? Obviously, the sleep um, really affected it on the Armor Rouge and the Ndidi, which did ultimately cause you know them to lose. But with a Trick Room being set up initially, you know they made really great adjustments going into the second game. Absolutely. And speaking of adjustments, I feel like there are so many micro adjustments in that set that really showcases, again, the level of understanding that all these players have. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate seeing that the, all the strategies that the players are bringing and allowing them to kind of coalesce into a beautiful <laughs> demonstration for, again, the strategies that you could bring in Pokemon. That's probably my favorite part of it. Again, all the different dimensions, the different mm -hmm. strategies. It's so dynamic with all these new mechanics like terrestrialization, like the protosynthesis slash quartz drive and these terrains. In fact, psychic terrain, I don't even remember what psychic terrain does. The terrains, I know the electric terrain prevents sleep and it boosts electric moves. Psychic terrain, that increases psychic attacks and... I'm not sure. Yeah. I think it like prevents sleep, uh, not sleep. It doesn't... Because electric it prevents train something prevents else, sleep. right? What does psychic train do? Chat, we need to know. Yes. Zach, we need to know what psychic train does. <laughs> the terrains are always weird for me. <laughs> That's why we're not playing out there. We'd be this like, what is does psychic train playing. do? We're in the back room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we've already seen three now, three incredible games, and we've got many more to come. We might be throwing it to a break soon as we're getting ready for the next couple of games going through. But before we send it over, we've seen, like I said, three already. How many more we're going to see? Not exactly sure, but you mentioned and you asked me what kind of strategies. I want to see going forward. I'm going to return the question to you. What do you want to see before we uh, end off the night? I got to be honest. I want to see my rain team guy come exactly. in. Exactly. Me you know, too. I've been come excited on, to on. see some. Come on. <laughs> the sun teams are great and all. I want to see and, Polia. And, and you see the sun team so often, but I want to see the Arcaladon come in. It's such a mainstay Pokemon, especially in this current like format right now. Um, I do want to see it come in. It's very interesting to kind of set it up and see how it works. If you do set it up properly, its damage output is phenomenal, especially with its stamina ability, you know, getting a defensive boost after every <laughs> contacted move, um, you know, and the special attack boost that you get from every time you click Electro Shock. <laughs> and the fact that there's that's... no drawbacks in the rain, so I powerful. do want to see a rain team come in. I think rain teams are really sweet. Mm -hmm. um, the Trick Room team was amazing. You know, obviously I wanted to see a Trick Room team coming in. Having it be Armor Rouge and DD was very interesting for me because that's like an older uh, sort of uh, like strategy. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting and it almost worked out too. It did play very well for them. Um, so yeah, now that we've seen the Trick Room team, I got to see a rain team coming soon. Absolutely. And, you know, we're in the third round of Swiss. La last one is going to be the next one, the fourth and final round before we head into the top bracket. It's going to be the top a tournament. Cut, exactly. And that's <laughs> where all the points and all the pride are going to be on the line. But as everything is still getting set up, we're going to throw things to a quick break and we'll see you guys very soon as we get ready for what's coming.
Hello, everybody, and we're back with our Swiss round four. It's getting very, very dicey here for some of these people, and I think the next game is going to be to see who makes it, makes the cut into the top eight. Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. You know, we have James Ooh. versus Gus. Whoever wins, they're both 2-0, or sorry, 2-1. and one. Whoever yes. wins this makes it to the top cut, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. There's still a chance, though, that whoever loses this ends up making it into the top cut. It very much depends. There's going to be some 2-0, oh, like, sorry, 2-2 two two players that do make it to the top cut, depending on who they won slash lost to. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, like, strength of records and whatnot, but we'll have to wait and see. For sure, whoever wins this will move on. Yeah, and so both of these players, who all these players coming into this next battle and the next one following, I believe, as well, they're going to be looking to make sure that they have their 100% active. And always, you know, that's the case. All these players want to make sure that they're playing at their best, but now more than ever, right? Because if you lose, then you don't get the opportunity to fight in the top cut. And speaking of players playing at their best, there are two people 3-0 and o currently, and they're battling it out this time to see who is the in the number one spot. That's going to be... I believe it's Connor Heron and Chris Belutz there just running a flawless game so far. So yeah, we saw Connor play earlier, yeah. too. Yes, we, we saw did. him like, take uh, the one set. Oh, was it 2-0? I can't remember what team. Yeah, that's not the match we have now, but those are the top dogs. But here we are with our match to see who makes the cut right now. Uh, you got your way. I going. got my okay. way. Let's okay. go. I appreciate you guys. This is going to be our Dolly to... Don. Yes, yeah. with the bug type terror type. Bug type Terra type Bug is definitely going to be very interesting. You got our Caledon coming out with the Tornadus. So Tornadus is kind of there to set up the Tailwind. Also has the Rain Dance too. I'm pretty sure it's going to go for Rain Dance just right away and get the Tailwind uh, set up later. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens there. Immediately though, the Terra comes out right away. And it's going to go on to... It happens. Yeah, it happens. Terra is too strong. And the it's Bug type Terra is going to go right to our Caledon instantly. I like that a lot. Um, a bug type is kind of a notorious type in the Pokemon community, known for some of the weaknesses and some of the shortcomings it brings, but here it's just Ooh. exactly what you want. But the Chien Pao, we haven't seen it have a huge impact thus far in the tournament, but it is going to instantly knock out your Tornadus, which is basically the backbone oh. of your team. And now your Golden Gate has gone for Draco Meteor, and uh, now its special attack is cut, and it didn't even get the Amoongus to half HP because it's and a citrus, citrus berry. berry so it's looking to be and it's asleep so you're in a really bad <laughs> spot right now um Gus is really on the back foot James getting all the reads that he needed to make it a very yeah. intelligent opening round play sending out the Rillaboom in response it's gonna have fake out at least so you're gonna get like maybe yeah. one more turn to play i think unfortunately though if you don't go for the fake out onto the Amoongus, it's just gonna fall asleep right so you really have to decide how you're gonna want to yeah. use your fake out here pretty much yeah the play is obviously to go for the fake out onto it because you don't want to have two people going to sleep just right away we saw that with some of the other games too where we had like two people go to sleep three people go to sleep and that's obviously not the way not going for the fake out though Going to go for the Grassy Glide to get that priority move onto Gem Power right away. And oh! Gen doing amazing what? damage with what? Ice Spinner. Rillaboom able to live it though. Gen Pao putting in a ton of work. <laughs> and Pollen Puff comes in to clean up the, the, the knockout. That's it for Rillaboom. I'm sorry, I can't even believe that Rillaboom survived that. I'm gonna take a look at the defense stats of this Pokemon because I'm really impressed. Surviving a Ice Spinner from Chen Pao? Yeah. That's impressive. That and it's impressive. Uh, unfortunately, it's not gonna, in fact, I'm not gonna say unfortunately, because that is forcing the Amoongus to commit a use onto that Rillaboom. That is gonna be a little bit more space for that yeah. Sneasler. Full HP on a Pokemon this fragile is still kind of scary. But it's better than being low HP. Yeah, Sneasler going for the Protect here probably doesn't help out too much. Just because, like, Sneasler is faster than all of James's Pokemon. <laughs> Sneasler could have came in, got out the knockout on Champ Pao, who's been doing but... a tremendous damage. But, you know, we the are going to see the right? Spore. The Spore, exactly. for sure. It did block the Spore, which is obviously And great. then that, that uh, Arcolodon is going to wake up. Yeah, that's, that's true. So they are basically, with that Protect, 
the Earth, what you said is what the base assumption is. Yeah. That this thing is going to go for something because it's the fastest Pokemon here. But if you protect, then you're forcing your opponent to actually think about what's going next and make yeah. your Sneasler have a little bit more relevance here. Ooh, the Zeraladon is going to get hit by that Sucker Punch, but that stamina is going to result in a defense boost. Yeah, which don't forget relevant. about the, ra like, uh, the Rage Powder, though. Amoog is directing all sort of True. attacks True. towards himself, but it doesn't turn out well. Amoogus falls asleep from uh, the Dire Claw, which is a broken move, to be fair. 50% <laughs> chance to sleep, 50% chance to like be paralyzed. It's, it's an insane move. The Drake Commuter comes out and finishes off Amoogus. We won't see any more Pokemon being put to sleep. This gouging fire is going to be is. brutal, though. Yeah, gouging fire is going to be brutal. Super effective against uh, Gus's um, Arcaladon with the Bug Type Sarah, um, and just a super oppressive Pokemon just overall. Um, and we'll see what kind of comes out here um, with Heat Crash being pointed towards the Arcaladon. We'll see what Gus ends up going for. Dire Claw comes out. No secondary effects come from that. The Ice Spinner targets towards Sneasler, and Sneasler now. Less than half HP remaining. Heat Crash is able to pick off and finish our Caledon, and now Gus on an extreme pack foot. <laughs> One P3 right now. Um, pretty much the game is sealed for James. James just has to not make any mistakes. Honestly, just dump two moves into people. I don't know if Sucker Punch is necessarily the move to go for it, because if they don't focus on oh, you, it was a the battle is cancelled anyways, so yep. it doesn't any even matter, but Honestly, great play from James, able to take out the Tornadus right away, Instantly. which immediately ruins, I don't want to say completely ruins Gus' strategy, but definitely it puts does. him on the back burner right away. Yeah, and again, I mean, I said it does, but a little tongue-in-cheek comment there. You absolutely are correct. It is a huge blow to the strategy, but like we saw with that Rillaboom and the other Pokemon that they brought forward on that lineup, you still have some life left in you, and mm -hmm. especially when you're playing as smart with that Protect play from that Sneasler. Uh, I really can't emphasize enough, again, these players really want to get into this next round, so I really feel like they're playing that strong and with all those heads-up plays coming through. So, first game, it's going to go James's way, but we still have at least one game left for them to both show what they're made of. I'm wondering, do, do we have the team lineups? Because I'm wondering yep, what he could swap do. in there, what Gus could do to maybe play a little bit against the team he just went up against, because... <sighs> It just did not go his way. The Dreldon was strong, but it seems like the rest of his team was not there to support him. He does have it. the Ogre Pond. Does have the Raging Bolt as well to bring yeah. out too, to try and handle the Gouging Fire, try and handle other, um, you know, super oppressive mons. But honestly, I think the play for Gus is still to sort of try and lead into that, like, uh, rain. Tornadus, uh, try and, like, get the uh, Rain Dance off to try and get the Tailwind off and whatever. But, you know... I honestly would say <laughs> commit the Terra. Right? Yeah. Do it on Tornadus, not uh -huh. on to your actual, uh, the dark you know, type. like your, you know, your super oppressive Pokemon. Put it on Tornadus, mm -hmm. allow him to get the Rain Dance off, and then give our Caledon the super massive boost that Rain Dance obviously allows. You know what I want to see though? Maybe you start seeing some Pokemon with Grounding Rod as their ability and start redirecting some of those electric. Because what's really, what else is really threatening your Tornadus? Exactly. <laughs> Right? You bring a grounding rod Pokemon, and well, you actually, actually you, no, that's maybe not, that's ice. not that's not true. That's ice. not true because Gen I Pals. see Gen Pao yes. one one hit knockout. That's fair. Right? Terra so. fire. Now what? I think you might you might see a terra here. That is true. But then you're no longer a flying type, so then the ground typing or the electric type is not going to be that effective. But still, in any case, we are now in game two, and that's a lot more important than speculating on possible alternate strategies in different futures. But what we're going to see right here, right now, yep. is the terrestrialization <laughs> onto the Fluttermane fairy type. It's about what you'd expect. A counter one. And counter terrestrialization, maybe. Trying to go for the similar strat is what you were saying. No, actually going to be leading the yeah. Ogre Pond. Now and the it's going to be... Ogre Pond is the terrestrialization and with that it also gets a special defense boost exactly. that comes with the wellspring mask um so it's obviously the embody aspect is going to come through get the special defense rise up right there um rillaboom pretty obviously going to go for the fake out just to get rid of the spore um from james obviously you don't want your pokemon to be going to sleep and that's a great play from him gets rid of the terrestrialized uh flutter and already off to a way better start than he was in the first game 
it's almost like yeah, I'm, I'm, I really, I'm sorry to cut you off, <laughs> Matthias, but I, I'm starting to see the importance and I'm wondering why more trainers haven't been bringing safety goggles on some of their more important lead Pokemon, right? Um, I feel like if you have a prankster safety goggles Pokemon, what really is interfering with your strategies for your setups? Because we've seen so many strategies kind of fall to spore already, or at least get significantly hindered by it. Uh, I'm curious to see, um, I'm curious to know what they are favoring over that, but with that fake out stopping at least the turn one spore, this Amoongus is going to have to do some more strategizing to figure out where it wants to yeah. commit that spore Ooh. on next. The That's ice a spinner. great read from Gus right there, what going from the protect, able to block out the ice spinner, which again, huge damage dealing Pokemon right there. We've seen Gen Bao be absolutely dominant from a lot of different teams from today. Gen Bao going to be able to survive from the Focus Sash, obviously, um, and you know, Amoongus getting the spore off is going to be able to put Wellspring Ogre Pond to sleep. Yeah, now that Xian Pao, after getting hit by that huge Ivy Cudgel, it's going to be down to the little bit of HP. Going to get healed up a little bit by that grassy terrain, but it's not going to matter too, too much because we've already talked to death how vulnerable this Pokemon really is. And this Rillaboom still asleep, but still in the game. Uh, it's gonna go for that grass slide, and it's gonna take out that Xian Pao. I think that's a huge boon for Gus's game plan. You don't really have to worry about that ice typing. You're gonna be putting so much pressure on some of your stronger Pokemon. Yeah, a huge play from, uh, from Gus right there. You know, obviously with the grassy terrain and the grassy glide, you know, it's a priority move for him, so he's able to get the, uh, the knockout. Um, on to Gen Pao, Gouging Fire coming in to replace him. Obviously the Protosynthesis, the Booster Energy activates Protosynthesis, has a Fire Attack uh, Boost. That's a 1.3 times boost, I believe. Mm. In any case, we're gonna start seeing, I'm realizing now we haven't seen Sun come out in this game, uh, in this game plan here. Uh, so I think that might honestly be why I'm not sure if uh, Gus ended up bringing the Tornadus at all, but the rain might not even be. In fact, you could completely forego the rain countering uh, aspect of this team lineup. You bring six, but you only bring four into battle. You could just completely forego the Tornadus and Arculodon and then just go for the rest. Uh, oh, well, never mind. Bring yeah. the Arculodon in regardless. Maybe it's not going to have yeah. the benefit of using that move, but it's still going to be threat regardless. It's going to resist half of that, thanks to the Dragon Typing, but the Stamina, stamina Boost Mad is going to make it a lot tougher to deal with now. Yeah, and like, as you said about the setups, you know, about the weather conditions and whatnot, James doesn't have anybody, any Pokemon that have, like, weather setup moves or weather setup abilities. James is coming in here fully with a fully balanced team, trying to play all aspects of the game. I love you know, that. not trying to lean too much into one strategy, so then it's very balanced, able to, you know, um, sort of adapt to other things. Um, Ogre Pong coming out with the spiky shield, and people, you know, Gouging Fire going to do the same with a Burning Roll Lock. We'll see what the others can do. The Draco Meteor comes through, but since it's a special move, the burn doesn't get put onto the Arcaladon, it just blocks it. The Mookus going with the Spore and puts Arcaladon to sleep, and now we're kind of back into the same sort of scenario <laughs> we were in the first game. Exactly. But now this Ogre Pond will be able to take a shot at this Gouging Fire. Here, the guy the Gouging Fire, it should be able to do some damage if it can get the hit in before it taken out by the Samugas. <laughs> I was I was just a little bit mistaken yeah. a little bit before which Pokemon was asleep. It was the Ogre Pond I was asleep this whole time, not the Rillaboom. Uh, but now that it's awake, we're going to start seeing the pressure that I can lay forth. So with the Ivy Cudgel matching the typing of the Pokemon, it's going to be a water type hitting that Amoongus Grass type. I thought it would probably go for the It did, fire. but the, uh, it was the Raging Powder redirected oh, okay. it over right. towards uh, uh, Amoongus. Uh, you missed it a little bit when you were talking about like the Pokemon being asleep. <laughs> yeah. But it's all good. Uh, the Raging Powder is a great move from Amoongus. Obviously redirecting I know you love it. the move over to uh, over to itself and Ogre Pong has no moves that can do any sort of super effective damage onto uh, Amoongus anyways. So really, it was just a really great play from James. I mean, you can Rage Powder all you want, but there's going to be consequences for it. This Amoongus is going to go down eventually, right? Um, you say that, but the Citrus Berry comes out now. Now it's already like <laughs> back down to like above, uh, you know, half health. This Duraludon is is honestly just really taking a beat. I feel like that's exactly like both sides Both of the field. Is for the body press? Oh, Drake. No, Drake. I was going to say. Get it out of here. And it's no, still, it's still alive. alive. still alive. 
Unbelievable. The spore now coming out. Ogre Pond back to sleep. Take a nap, my friend. And this Duraludon now gonna be really the only <laughs> chance you have. Gonna go for the Grass Knot onto the Ogre Pond, and there isn't really gonna be anything you can do about it here. It's just gonna have to take that huge chunk of damage, and the Heat Crash gonna take out the Duraludon. Things are not looking very good for Gus. You know, Gus kind of started off this game on a really good footing, starting off with the two knockouts, and now James, you know, adapting and playing really well against Gus, is now kind of evened out the playing field. Ogre Palm still asleep. Uh, let's see, Gus brings out Rillaboom back out again. The Grass Surge is able to come, uh, come back up, and now he still has some sort of priority left. But I think the kind of play is just to get rid of, he's gonna go for the Spore, but I feel like Rillaboom is just gonna try and get rid of goes for the fake out, which is honestly a great Taking play. It out I was well. gonna say he could have went for the gra grassy glide, which would have done the same thing, just more damage, kind of secure the knockout, um, but still ends up working out the same way. I mean, you can always go for grassy glide, but you only get that one chance to use fake out. It feels nicer, but it is gonna take a heat crash. It's gonna go down eventually, and now we're <laughs> face down by the Battle of the Typings, fire versus water. But <laughs> ironically enough, it's gonna be kind of neutral since yeah. uh, Gouging Fire is gonna be resisting the water hits of the Dragon Typing. It's still gonna be neutral, and the Sneasler coming out, and it's gonna be a bit of a threat here. Yeah, the one. grassy seed kind of popping. Sorry to hit you. No, no, I, I'm good. I think we're just in a, in a play where <laughs> we're going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. We just keep interrupting you. Uh, the grassy seed boosts Sneasler's defense. So I kind of hope that it still is able to live at least one hit from the Gouging Fire. Uh, Sneasler is a very hyper-offensive fo focused Pokemon with no defensive capabilities really, so that Grassy Seed is able to help out at least a little bit. Um, Gouging Fire did target Sneasler, which did protect, so it is a great move for Gus, you know, stalling one more turn to try and hope that, uh, you know, Ogre Pong can fall out of, like, you know, his sleep, but <laughs> the Tire Claw comes through and gets Brown's oh, wow. size. Yeah, now the Ivy Casual comes out. It's pretty much just game for Gus at this point. Yeah. Oh, dude. For Gouging Fire. If Gouging Fire can get a knockout with Heat Crash, it's still possible and it does not isn't able through. to get it. And it, it's pretty much just game at this point. Yeah, Gus is going to make the comeback. Unless we start seeing some catastrophic misses coming out, this is going to go his way. And the series will most likely be tied up after this one. Spiky Shield just to really make things all much harder. Well, this and is the thing. He's going to go for Blade Blade Pearl Walk, right? True. So, Ogre Pong stalls the turn by going for Spiky Shield. He's gonna, He's gonna go for Burning Roll Walk. And this is the thing, Dire Claw is a physical attacking move, so it's gonna make contact. Yeah. But look at now, it's burn. burn. It burn, burn comes It's through. at like three HP. <laughs> it, it, sure, I, sure, but it still gets some sort of like help. And it's gonna even heal off the burn damage. <laughs> no, I, 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 you were cooking. Just, I'm just thinking for James. You were yeah, cooking, it is possible, him. because now really, realistically, if we do see a miss come out, Spiky Shield it's, is down, right? Like, so like, let's, let's be honest, it's not possible. I'm just thinking, like, that was still a pretty I'm trying to help you out here, boys. <laughs> I'm at least trying to, like, stall out the game. Yeah. But Gus, you know, the inevitable comes through. Gus is able to pick up the second game of the set. And finally, oh, look at that smile. we're going to uh, game three. Yeah. Very excited to see what both of these trainers are going to be bringing to the table here. I have... I, uh, I, I... Have I mentioned that I love Pokemon battling? Have I, have I mentioned that I don't yet? think you have. I, I I'm going to mention have. it once again. I really love the dynamic strategies that both of these trainers are bringing forth into this battle. We already saw the switch up from the lineup. Bringing that Ogre Pond actually allows so much to get done beforehand. <laughs> again, no offense to the Tornadus, but really didn't bring too much to the table in the previous round. It immediately got knocked out. But with that Ogre Pond representing such a huge thorn in the side of his lineup, you really have to try to answer it. Those grassy knots from the Amoongus, they they were really there, but realistically, you didn't have not you did not have a lot of opportunities to go for it. Um, just has so many opportunities wasted mm -hmm. because of the pressure and the countering coming out from his opponent not really going to be able to get to do everything that he wanted to there. I think the Tornadus is still a good lead. It just kind of depends on how you play uh, how you play around it, right? Mm -hmm. 
I still do think that the Tornadus will come back because he did mention previously so. that the Arcaladon Tornadus Rain Dance sort of strategy is his main sort of play. Mm -hmm. And obviously, James was able to pick up on that immediately in the first game, take out the Tornadus, and kind of throw their strategies just completely off rail. Um, so we'll kind of see what ends up happening here. I do believe and I do hope that Gus does lead into that rain dance sort of tornado. So here's the scary thing. So he changed up his team because the tornadoes or Carla down is kind of a little obvious, right? So you go yeah. for the next one. You're not really playing around it. Now, though, when you're trying to think about what you're bringing to this it's next a game, game, you might be trying to counter the lineup that didn't have it. Right. But now he can bring it in, and he's going to be able to play with his main strategy. What's important to remember was that lineup that he was we'll bringing, see, though. it was not his main strat, but now we're Ooh. seeing this one might be, as you have the Tornadus followed up with the Ogre Pond, this could be but what you might the Ogre Pond right. could go with Follow Me. That's here. what I was going to say. And could it just could redirect follow me. the Ice Spinner just directly towards him. It is going to be It does have damage. Follow Me. It, I know it. I know it does. Of course it does. <laughs> Has follow me, so this will guarantee the rain dance will go off, and then I guess honestly the hardest part about this will be bringing in your Duraludon safely. Yeah, Gus is gonna go for or the Rascalization onto the Ogre Pong there, so you know special defense boost, you know going pure mono water type, and with the follow me, if they do choose to go with follow me right here, will definitely help out with the ice spinner that's supposed to be going towards uh, Tornadus right now. Follow me is gonna go. Oh, actually, no, that's gonna be Amoongus getting taunted. Chien Pao now getting the ice spinner onto Tornadus again. Yeah, it's a big leading hit from Gus. Don't know why he went Tornadus to start. I guess he wants to try and counter that Amoongus, but he just can't with the Chien Pao also leading. So, Gus definitely has a strategy in mind that we haven't been able to quite figure out yet. Uh, I, I really was confident there that the follow me was likely going to come out. But you know what? Amoongus, no spore for what, two, three turns? Yeah, that's true. I still would have thought though with like them committing the Terra, I would have thought that they would have went for the follow me. I think it's a pretty obvious play that Gen Pao is going to go for the Ice Spinner and it did yeah. knock it out the first game. So I thought they were yeah. going to follow me, but, you know, ends up trying to just get the damage output onto Chen Pao right away. Really Boom is probably going to fake out or do something to try and knock out uh, Chen Pao right now. So I do get it. You're getting rid of the damage output that Chen Pao does have, which is, a, again, super, 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 like, threatening. I'm um, thinking, worst case, you follow me with your Ogre Pond. It's probably, what, going to take the Ice Spinner and, worst case, Grass Knot? Or more realistically spore and ice spinner you're not upset about that at all yeah. and and then you have rain which just really then you bring in the you, your tornado is still awake mm -hmm. and you can just taunt the among us after right then you can bring a duraludon in but Chien, i completely was out of this battlefield for the longest time here i come back to my attention and we have the among us with a water typing now thanks to the terrestrialization and we have the Sneasler coming in. Gouging Fire or King Gambit could be coming out now with the cool glasses. Gonna be using the Dark Knight with Matthias. Can you tell me why he went Terra Water into the Rillaboom? It's an interesting would pick. Would that not sure. make his moves more effective? It would. <laughs> it's a very interesting pick. I don't know why James decided to go for a Terra Water. Generally, you go Terra Water to try and combat it's, your fire yeah. weaknesses, right? <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's definitely questionable, uh, but we'll kind of have to wait and see. Yeah, we'll have to see if there's some strat afoot that we don't quite know about. But here we are, seeing Dark Claw come out, which is it gonna be? And it's the poison on the Gouging Fire, so that's gonna win. Dark Claw's just away. a broken move. <laughs> I just to say, fifty percent to do any sort of secondary status effect is insane. Yeah, it's a very strong move. My first time really seeing the power that it can bring. But the protects Benson, the Rilla Boom, really just taking all the attention here and allowing space for everybody. The poison on the Gouging Fire is actually going to be pretty relevant because we saw the staying power that this Mon has. And honestly, it's going to add up. Uh, I feel like if you can get at least one Pollen Puff off on your Gouging Fire, you'll be happy about that. But it's probably not going to be very likely because any turn you could be doing that, you could be casting Spore uh, or putting Spore down on any other Pokemon. So, Rage Powder going to come from the side of Amoongus, but I already do feel 
yeah, that Rillaboom was going to target Amoongus regardless if he did use, uh, you know, Rage Powder or not. Yeah. Still, Amoongus is going to get into the level where he's able to activate Citrus Berry um, and see what comes through. Dire Claw is able to come through, get some damage. And now Amoongus, again, just super low HP. Rillaboom is probably going to be able to just go for the Grassy Glide again next turn with the priority, able to get out the knockout onto Amoongus. I don't know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Indeed, this Amoongus is nowhere near fast. Oh! Okay. I like that. I really think it makes sense here. The steel typing from that King Gambit will resist most of the offenses coming out here. So it's not even going to be in a bad shape after it takes these hits, plus the grass is trying healing. You say that, but in case, if which Sneezer does have close combat. Yeah, close but combat I'm talking about coming out, though. Obliterate. It does have Sucker Punch. I'm assuming. Oh, he ready. He got, we Swords Dance. <laughs> But okay, he, he crashes. Gonna go up on Rillaboom. Rillaboom. Rillaboom does get okay. knocked out, but still, I think Sneasler is still in a good position. Has the plus two boost from Sword Stance. It is. Has the close combat to get onto the King Gambit. I don't think, especially because, like, like I said, Sneasler is a poison fighting type. Can resist yeah, the dark move. I was just gonna say it's now come to my attention that Sneasler is not nice type. You thought Sneasler was it? <laughs> I thought it was you think an it's ice Sneasel. poison. Yeah, I know. I thought it was. I thought it was ice poison instead of ice dark. It's a fight. It's a poison fighting type. poison type. It's so like even if they do go for sucker punch, yeah, it still will resist it and hopefully live. Like you know, Sneasler is the sleeper pick. You were right. I told you. Yeah, you Sneasler were right. This is such pick, a man. strong Pokemon for this oh, meta. The spiky shield. And the spiky, the spiky shield, shield uh, is going to be a great play, especially because they were targeting them too. So it's going to be a, a it's little gone. bit of damage, but it it's gone. Out. King Gambit's gone. The close combat completely obliterates King And <laughs> the best part about close combat on Sneasler is this Pokemon is so squishy, you don't even care if it's getting its defenses reduced because it's, it's, so getting, it's gonna get knocked oh. out in one, anyways. And you're gonna see that here, the heat crash, but this Sneasler's taken out basically two Pokemon, effectively took out three by itself. That is true. As I said in, the, in previously when talking about Sneasler, Sneasler is that sort of glass cannon type of Pokemon where they can 100% get a one hit knockout on like <laughs> almost any Pokemon in the game. It's a super, super, super powerful and fast Pokemon, but has barely any defenses to live any attack. So obviously Gouging Fire is going to be able to get the knockout on there, but Gus on the complete back foot right now still has enough HP to maybe hopefully make this work. Grassy Glide comes through, gets the knockout on there. And With the poison. He's going to come. Yeah, exactly. The poison right there too. He has Heat Crash. He's going to use it, but it's going to like... It's, it's, it's not a great position. Right? Oh, he's going to go for Breaking Sweat. My apologies. I thought he went for a Heat Crash. I don't know why I thought he went for Heat Crash. We're back to this situation where it's these ball barks, these giant beasts of Pokemon, and they're going to be the last line of defense for both of these teams. And, and both Pokemon end up going for <laughs> Which is, is fair. That was probably the good play for both of them. It really too. was. Maybe not for James, just because James is poisoned, right? Yeah. And that now he's put in the range. Even though he's quad resistant, where Gla Grassy Glide. Actually, never mind. Grassy Train's not even there. I was going to say anymore. Grassy Glide could maybe technically knock him out, but he's not even in the range to do so. Yeah, absolutely. So this game. What? He went for the double protect. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> but, oh but it doesn't even knock him out. It doesn't knock him out, but will the poison take him out? It will the not. Does it? Six HP. Wait, what? Wait, who's faster? Wait. Now it's wait, come what? down to wait, a speed faster? check. Here it is. Another oh spiky gosh! shield, a triple spike shield. There we are. Wait, and it's what? gonna go through. <laughs> he has to go for a heat crash. That's his only oh option. But the spiky shield stands strong. And Gus, James falls. Gus comes back from being on the back foot and takes the set two to one. Gus is gonna put a hundred percent move on to the top cut. Oh, Look, and we'll see if James is able to join him there later. Hugs all around wow. there. That was a good game. Wow. That was a good game. I, wow. <laughs> I feel honored. I feel privileged to have even watched that. I feel lucky I was here for that. That was such a battle of wits. And there were so many interactions that came into play there. You really got to see. You want you you asked for it. You didn't necessarily get it. <laughs> I didn't because get it. the Archaelodon. I, I did wish we you got know, to see the rain. The tornadoes knocked out instantly both times it showed about. But, you know, it... It was still an incredible battle, even mm -hmm. though you didn't get to see the strategies that you wanted to see. I want to say my favorite part of this is that the Sneezler's name was Bless You. 
the I sneeze. Even, uh, <laughs> I wasn't even focusing on James's pants. I wasn't even focusing on, you know, Sneezler's name. But I like the Ogre Pond's name was doing for her. It was just yep. a strong, powerful statement, you know? Let's go. It got him the win in the end, so, you know, he needs some motivation exactly. to make it all the way here, and now he's making it to top eight here. Yeah. 100%. The finals, the top cut that's so coveted by both of these teams. Bro, I'm, I'm so, teams, used, to so used to casting. Yeah. Casting. <laughs> these these teams. teams. So coveted. Pokemon teams. Yeah. Hey. You know, but more than both, all of the <laughs> competitors that made it out here tonight were so honored and so happy to have everybody who showed up. Thank you so much for coming out, and thank you for making all these battles so interesting. And uh, hey, hey, I know we I sound like I was about to, to say, to. you know, make no mistake, we still got a lot of action coming. Those were just the Swiss rounds, final round of Swiss. We might have a last game for Swiss coming up, or we might going straight into the top cut after this. But either way, we still have the top cut action, and that's going to be where the main event really comes through. The battle, the race for first place, the race for who can get the 30 points towards qualifying for the World Championships for Pokemon VGC. And you know, we haven't seen everybody compete today, but out of the people mm -hmm. that we did get a chance to watch, did get a chance to see, who do you think probably has the best chance of making it all the way to the grand? Let's, let's touch grand finals first. We're not even going to touch about who wins. We'll touch grand finals. Uh, I'm going to say Connor. You. You're going to say Connor? Just looking at this this win sheet, mm -hmm. right now we're seeing Connor go up against Chris. I don't know the result of that match since we didn't see it, but just Connor, we did see him play. He mm -hmm. played very, very well. Just looking at the win rate, it's it's a thing to see, you know, just going flawless all the way through. Yeah. If you won that game as well, I think he's a shoe in for the grand finals. Just but looking at the team sheets here, uh, I'm, I'm taking a look at Connor's team. I feel like if we're favoring sunny day like you know standard meta teams i feel like connor might be the most flexible as well as potent sunny day team and player here like you mentioned played so consistently so adaptable in the games we saw before but if we're talking more wild card teams i gotta throw maybe it's some recency bias but gus seems to be a very strong <laughs> contender as well seeing how they adapted to those games there. I, I, I really couldn't ask for anything more. Gus did adapt very quickly, made a couple of key errors in the first uh, first game of the set, but was, like you said, adaptability, was easily mm -hmm. able to pick up off part. of their mistakes and change up their entire game plan. Initially, led with the uh, Tornadus, led with the Arcaladon. It was a pretty obvious lead um, and got punished for it, like per se. And then immediately back, like pivoted and switched over to, you know, thinking of different strategies uh, going forward. And it ended up working out well for them. I gotta so oh. I do agree with you a little bit. Yeah, Gus is obviously, for me, a top contender. I do got to agree with you, though. I think Connor, from the one time that we did see him, I thought he played amazing, made very, very, very minimal mistakes, if any. So I, I'm probably going to take Connor as my favorite. And when it comes down to it, if we're seeing so many of these sunny day comps, right? He has uh, rain. Sun, huh? He has Sorry. rain, yeah. Oh, yeah, he has rain. And rain. also, when it comes to Connor, it's just whoever knows it best, right? If you know this sun comp the best, you know what the most optimal moves are going to be. You know what your opponent's probably going to want to do if it's also your game plan as well. So I think he does have the best shot, but the rain is probably going to come in clutch if he can get it up. Exactly. Um, in, in terms of the battles that we're going to see for the rest of the night, in terms of the battles that we've seen so far, it really just has been such high quality, high level Pokemon. And I am so happy that we had the opportunity to do this here today. And I'm looking so forward to what more we have in store down the line. And even more so, I'm more excited to see what we have later on still. The action is not over yet and the top cut is coming. We're going to throw it to a quick break while everything is getting settled and sorted out before we get everything for ready for the top cut. But until then, we want you all to stay tuned, stay eager, heal up your Pokemon because we're going to go into the final battles soon.
We are back with our top cut of the Pokemon VG Challengers, and it has been an amazing long day here, oh, but I'm yeah. here for it. I want to see Woo! more Pokemon battles. We're getting here close to the finals. What are you guys thinking? Yeah, I mean, so far today, like I, like I mentioned before we went to a break, it's just been such an honor to be ha even having this tournament here. You know, the We Play Pokemon VG Premier Challenge and all these competitors having the opportunity to earn points for the World Championship and the circuit and being able to compete on the grand stage of Pokemon. I'm just very happy that we have the opportunity to facilitate these battles. And speaking of these battles, we are now in the top cut. We're going to see the semifinals and then, of course, the grand yeah. finals coming up after that Owen you know we've had a long day talking about Pokemon and it feels like it's only been 10 <laughs> minutes if you ask me but time flies when you're having fun how have you been enjoying the day so far I've been enjoying it it's been a really good day it's been awesome to see the sort of differences between different teams we've saw, mm. seen like the main Torkoal Sun teams obviously been dominating throughout the day but we have seen other teams come in for example Gus who's going to be on stream in just a minute uh, we've seen his sort of rain dance team he didn't end up getting rain dance off but you know we've seen <laughs> balance teams come through uh, so it's been pretty nice to see the sort of diversity of uh, the teams that we've had in this tournament. Mm -hmm. It's also been nice to just see this tournament and see it sort of be like live out. You exactly. Know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a rain dance team in name only. But again, you could have one main strategy lined up for you and you might not even end up using it at all. And you still end up winning. True. That shows the level of strategy yeah. and depth that Pokemon can have. And as we are going to get ready for the semifinals match, we are going to have Gus versus Chris. We saw, I believe, Chris earlier on in the day there. We got Gus, the winner of the previous set, enjoying his time here for sure. And looking Look ready. Gus smiling right there. Us. He's very Pretty happy cool to be shirt. here. And Chris, you know, Chris obviously here. I don't think we've gotten to see Chris I'm not sure. I don't, I'm pretty sure we didn't get to see Chris earlier. So it's going to be interesting to see what he brings. He has Gouging Fire, King Gambit, Chen Pao, Ogre Pong, Wellspring, Rillaboom, and Frigoraph. We're going to jump right into it. He leads Chen Pao and Gouging Fire. And Gus is going to go for the Tornadus and Raging Bull, which we haven't seen him bring out once throughout his last set. Sure, he's getting flashbacks, though, from this Chen Pao. Just one-shotting his Tornadus, I'm pretty sure. He's trying to think of how to avoid that. Doing the rain dance and debating maybe even a switch out here, but he's gonna go for the full yeah. send rain dance. He's gonna commit the rain dance, assuming the thunderclap is gonna come out. He's gonna try and tear a fairy though. I do think he should try and commit, like I mentioned in like the break. I think he needs to commit the like the terra onto the tornadoes. Because obviously Chen Pao is gonna target tornadoes right here. Right, it just makes sense too. 
Um, I, I do see the mirror in going for the Terra on the fairy typing for mm -hmm. your uh, Rage. Oh, he also does a Terra okay. fairy. Okay. Because, yeah, the dragon typing being super effective against itself. Both of these Pokemon, some of the strongest Pokemon on their teams, are both going to be dragon types. We're going to see what the Terra is going to be committed on here. It's going to be still going to be the Terra fairy. Yeah. They're both yes. going to, yeah, okay. both committing the Terra fairy onto their. Uh, raging bolts and gouging fires. Um, so obviously going to negate the sort of dragon moves that they would have received from each other. So it's obviously a great play on both sides. Rain Tornadus does off. get the rain dance off, obviously because of Prankster. Um, but yeah, we're going to see what happens now. Going with the Howl to raise their attack um, on both sides too, got to yeah. imagine. That's going to be scary. At Chien Pao, the boosted with the Ice Spinner. Uh, actually going to be targeting the Raging Bolt, and since it's such a tanky Pokemon, it's going to survive it. But the Thunder Overstash. coming out, which of course, yeah. you're running rain, you're going to run Thunder because it's guaranteed accuracy in the rain. The Chien Pao is going to survive thanks to the Focus Sash, but only one real turn left. But with the Thunderclap, could switch out and take out the Chien Pao in the meantime. That's going to leave Tornadus in a pretty good spot, not yeah. really facing any threats. The thing is, there's no reason why the Chien Pao wouldn't run Protect right now. It's on 1 HP. Could go for a swap out or Protect. He has a couple options here, so this might not go through the Raging Bolt's attack here. And in terms of, if, for example, if the Chien Pao wants to go for a Sucker Punch, I'm not sure how you break the tie there. Uh, it is going to go for the you Protect. You break the tie based off of speed. Um, so yeah, it does go okay. to Protect, obviously, like, handle the Thunderclap, but it still can beat it in terms of, like, the Sucker Punch. Chen Pao, great damage output, even with, like, the neutral damage oh, okay. coming from it, still was able to get more than half the uh, Flame Crash, oh, sorry, like, uh, Flame Crash coming in, gonna do about half damage on the Tornadus, and you're still in such a great position. You have the Rain Dance up, right? You still have the... You just did, um... Tailwind. What's it called? Yeah, sorry. The Tailwind. You're in such a great position to now lead this game. You have the Speed Boost, and you have the Rain Dance, or if you did bring uh, Arcaladon. Uh, so we'll see what happens now. So it takes out the Tornadus, and then subs it out for the Rillaboom. I, I really do like that protect play, and uh, I don't know if that's good though. He could use the the. I'm talking about the previous. Oh yeah, sorry. The previous play. <laughs> it does keep the Shen Pao in. Gonna switch it out because even if it's at one HP, that Shen Pao is still gonna be a very. Big Gus Pokemon. right there though. So excited that he did end up swapping out. He kind of just went for the prediction, and it ended up working out well for him. One thing I do, I, I was interested to see, went for that heat crash onto the Tornadus instead of the Raging Bolt. I figured he might want to try to get that Raging Bolt as low as he can because that Tornadus uh, is still always going to be one uh, Ice Spinner away from a knockout from your Chien Pao. So, interesting to see how that worked up there. Now we're in a bit of a scary situation for both yeah. trainers right now. Your strongest Mons are pretty low. The Gouging Fire, the exception to that there, and the Brain Burning Bulwark is going to get committed. But he's going to go for the fake out too. Rillaboom is going to go for the fake out onto the Burning Roll Walk. King Gambit also commits a protect, so we've got double protects going on on both sides. <laughs> but the fake out comes out. That's a contact move. Rillaboom is going to be burned. Exactly. And uh, so that moves Pretty sure, very confident here that Rillaboom's best moves are all physical. Yeah, so they are. Burn yeah. is going to be a pretty big hindrance to your game plan here. And don't even forget, we're running out of rain. Turns are, are about running out. No yeah. damp rock on the tornado. It's going to be a covert cloak that is holding. So this is going to run out pretty soon. Might be one or two turns that we have the guaranteed thunders left. They're not stabbed, but they are about 110 in power. These are still very strong moves regardless. So that's going to be one less thing to worry about on Chris's side. With the King, Ban King Gambit out and the uh, gouging fire. Look at the intensity of the trainers. Not even ingested in game, both in real life. Their faces are so so focused and contemplative, deciding what the best move might be here. Ultimately, the Grassy Fly is going to come out onto the Burning Bulwark. I'm well, sorry, the uh, Gouging Fire. Sucker Punch isn't going to land, and Heat Crash is going to get committed onto the Raging Bolt. A crit! And it's it's still crit gonna and it did barely nice. anything. It looked like it did about like 15% of its health. King Gambit's gonna fall. And this rain is such a good play oh, exactly. against yeah. the damage, the fire damage as well. Even on that crit, as you saw, it did such little damage. Well, the rain has stopped. 
the clouds have gone away. You still have your Tornadus. It's gonna, uh, it, it does have Prankster, so you really can get one more Rain Dance out. And the Tailwind's gone too, both at exactly. the same time. The Tailwind and the Rain Dance, and now you're kind of at sort of a like even playing field. Again, like you said, Tornadus is still on the back line, so you can bring it back out and get that, at least the Rain Dance or the Tailwind, whatever you sort of prefer, back up. Just I like this play. Team. I like this play here, both protecting. They know that the Rillaboom is going to be running fake out. You don't even want to risk anything here. And then the Gouging Fire, it's not going to... I don't think it's running any setup moves, so you're not risking anything. It is going to have Howl. So if Chris does predict the double protect, he could set up the Howl. And that would honestly even benefit the Rillaboom. Uh, because again, both uh, best moves coming up from Rillaboom are going to be physical. So. It, it is going to come down to whether or not Chris reads this double protect. I think it might be fairly obvious here. You might just want to go for it regardless. Even if you're not sure, it's not putting you too much of a risk here. We're going to have to see. I'm going to see the really good. And the Raging Bolt go for the double protect. You see what Chris ends up going for. Rillaboom with the fake out. It's a great play from Gus right there. So obviously, Rillaboom is going to go for the fake out off rip. And the Howl, and the Howl does come through. Yep. That's a great read from Chris. Able to get the attack boost on both himself and Rillaboom. I believe that's a double attack boost because he did get one earlier. I think so. When Shen Pao was in, he didn't switch So now, great, like, gouging fire. Is that a two times attack boost right now? Whatever Pokemon is going to get hit by this next heat crash is most likely going to fade to it. Especially that Rillaboom solo, but you don't even, I don't think you want to commit it onto your Rillaboom. Onto the Rillaboom because it's already so low. Contemplating maybe that double protect, <laughs> that would have honestly. <laughs> It's been pretty, pretty yeah. risky, but honestly, kind of worth it because I'm not sure. Uh, yes. That Rillaboom, you want to get it out, but you don't want to commit anything too crazy onto it. And if you do ignore it, then that is some moves coming up. Thunderclap coming out. I really like this play. This Raging Bolt is in a very scary predicament here. It ultimately, it's going to go for the Heat Crash to get rid of the Rillaboom. The other Rillaboom here is probably going to end up hitting whatever is going to switch. Oh, sorry. Thunderclap is not a switch up move. It is just a sucker punch. Right. Wood Hammer is going to go into the Raging Bolt. It's going to take Ooh, it away the crit. It takes out the Huge. Raging Bolt. Gus, I believe with still two on the back, he has Tornadus. I don't know what else he has. Might still just be one, but very sure. I think it is just one. I think he just has Tornadus left in the back one. I think you're right. And if, uh, if you're not, then that's still just the really weak Tornadus. And then maybe oh, no, he has a Sneasler. How Sneasler. can we forget yeah, the MVP of this forget team? Forget about Sneasler. The MVP, the Paldea champion. That's going to be huge. That's going to counter the fairy terrestrialization of the of the Gouging Fire. Think of that. This... With the Poison type. Exactly. Counters Gouging Fire. And with Rillaboom. Oh, with the you're fighting right. Type, count, counters Rillaboom. Sneasler is the MVP here. He's going to go for the Tailwind. I believe, yeah, the Dire Claw probably on the Gouging Fire is the best. Uh, it kind of depends. I think I think Protect might even be the play here because you want to try you know to get the Squishy, right? You want to focus all your fire while you still have two Mons up. But I think the Protect still fast is going to come through. That's true, that's true. Still fast enough to the point where either way, unless he goes for Grassy Gliding, trying to get for that, like, priority. I don't still know. fast enough to get a knockout on at least one of them. I, I feel like don't. Rain might have been the play. Rain w must have been the better play there, I think, but it's still looking very good for him nonetheless. Gets Claw off, and now, oh no! Gets taken out, should have gone for the Protect there. I think just got a little yeah. overeager. If he got the Rain off, went for the Protect. I think that would have been his game, but now Chris just with <laughs> making better use right now, wins the game at one. Yeah, I think the rain would have definitely helped his chances and might have helped him win the set, win the game at least for sure. He the didn't tailwind need the extra doesn't really speed. matter that much because either way, Prankster is still able to like be faster, yeah. and Sneezer is faster than almost every Pokemon in the game. So it really didn't matter if he had Tailwind or not. But still, though, he was kind of just on the back foot. Both like one, one Tornadus was yes. low. Um, he was kind of in a bad position, anyways. So still, great play from uh, from Chris there, though. I really, I, I mean. I mean, rain seems to be the obvious-ish yeah. kind of play, but I, I, am, I am seeing the rationale against it. That gorging fire, I keep calling it gouging. in my head. Gouging, gouging <laughs> fire. It's either gorging fire or Ente. burning for a walk. Never gouging fire. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, um, it was double boosted. You know, uh, yeah. whatever, that heat crash, it's going to hurt. 
regardless. Uh, Rain Dance, it's going to reduce the fire uh, fire type effectivity by how much exactly? It's like... Th- I think it's like by half, quarter? right? Okay, maybe it would have actually... <laughs> yeah, it would have been... That would have a... been a great play, honestly, yeah. if you did go for the I Rain Dance. I think you go Rain Dance, but Protect, and then you try and take them keep down Keep in mind, one. still Breaking Swipe. True. So, Heat Crash isn't the only attacking move that the... Um, Gouging Fire is going to be bringing to the field. It's going to be, you know, <laughs> at least it has that breaking swipe. It's a lot lower power, but with the double attack boost, it's still... Plus, it would reduce the attack That's of the true. Sneasler. That's so true. even if it doesn't KO, it would significantly yeah. reduce the threat that that's... Yeah, like, Chris was already on, like you said, the back foot. Or, sorry, Gus was already on the back foot yeah. there. Very confusing with, like, the names being in different orders. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Gus was already in, in a weird position there. Um, so he, he kind of just had to try and pull something out of nothing, but um, we'll kind of see where he's going to be looking towards uh, in this second game. We know Gus as a player who's very like quick to adapt to what his opponents are doing. Like we saw in the first game in the last series that we just watched, mm-hmm. right? Gus got obliterated right away. Yeah, right, right away. Tornado's gone. <laughs> I would have already gone, quit the game. He was, if was already a two v four, just immediately right away. But then he was able to quickly pivot, win game two, and ultimately win game three, making the top cut. So we'll see what comes out here as we're going in to the second game. Ooh. Gus brings out Rillaboom and Sneasler just right oh, away. No. Chris bringing out King Gambit and Gouging Fire. Yeah, yeah that Gouging gonna have... Fire is going to be very tough into this matchup, and the King Gambit as well. Sneezer are going to be holding the grassy seed, so it's going to get a defense boost as well, which is exactly what you're going to want against these two starters here. Uh, the booster energy is going to boost the speed of the Gouging Fire, so exactly who's the fastest Mon here? I'm not sure between the Sneezer and the Gouging Fire. Uh, either way, we still have to worry about grassy slide, so it might not even be on it. This Silly. Plus, I think it's, 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 it's definitely Sneasler that's really? faster than Gouging Fire. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I like, I'm pretty sure they would like invest like 100% into the speed aspect. Um, so it should be the fastest pawn, but yeah, it doesn't really matter right now as Chris is gonna go good for the protect and a good that's read huge. from Gus again going for the swords dance. Yeah, this Sneasler already such a threat. Uh, I'm curious. I feel like some terrestrializations might come out either way from either player. Gonna go for the swap in off the Rillaboom. I like that a lot. Utilizing as many Fakas as you can. This space first turn basically came down to just Sneasler getting uh, the Sword Dance. Dance. Yeah. Off. And, and also, also, Gus had a choice between two of which to fake out, and he chose the King Gambit because if he did fake out burnt. that Gouging Fire, he would have been burnt, and that would have been awful for this physical type attacker here. Now, the switches are going to start to come in here. I'm curious to see how Chris might be thinking. You know, we're definitely seeing things from Gus's perspective. But with Chris looking down this, you see Sneezer as a much bigger threat, but I'm not sure how you best go about trying to answer it. If Terrasalization could be a play, or maybe even set up of yourself. And of course, if you're suspecting that your Sneezer might be the target of an onslaught, then you start protecting, right? Which is exactly what he's going to go for. Sucker Punch is going to connect, and the Breaking Swipe is going to get protected out, but it's at least going to do something against the Tornadus. Um, any amount of damage you'll take, because it goes from maybe surviving, or it's definitely not in one-shot territory, I don't think, without any of those ice moves, but now it might be. Again, Gus aiming to go for uh, the tail loop again. What? Again, like you said, probably Rain Dance is the better play. Still gonna go for the Tailwind to guarantee that they have speed control. But we'll see how it works out. I do think Rain Dance would have been the better play, able to uh, negate sort of the damage that's coming from Heat Crash. And oh, sorry, how for Tailwind there? Yeah. Or, okay. So he went for he, he clicked Tailwind, so he's committing to it. Already committed to it. Um, so obviously would have helped with the damage output of Gouging Fire, which has been which was super dominant the last game. And now, you know, we are in game two of this matchup, but if you are curious how the other side of semifinals is going, turns out Connor got upset and Angelo is going to be making it to the wow. finals. Wait, Connor got 2 0 that quickly? Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. I don't know if it was a 2 0, but. Angelo is a force. <laughs> it was a 2 0. It was a 2 0. Yes. That's, that's crazy. Angelo coming out with a 2 0 on Connor. But we, we kind of just skipped over a whole turn of this battle. Yeah, that was the true. Match. It's crazy. It looks like he tried to set the tailwind. I do think that there might he be a tailwind. He did get the tailwind set up already. Yes. Um, he committed like tailwind last turn. 
Um, so we'll see what happens out this turn right now. Try and taunt here so we can open up attack this Nisler here. Oh, we're gonna get a swap out for Chris. That's honestly probably the good place. Nisler is just able to commit close combat onto King Gambit and just knock it out instantly. But going for Rillaboom. Honestly, oh, he still goes for the Firefly anyways. And crits, and, a and paralysis. the Paralysis. You can see oh, how hype he is. Goodness. Look at him. <laughs> I would be happy too. off of that play. Yeah, I'd be happy too there. The, get, everything's the looking up for Gus right now. It's looking up, man. Because if he goes for the bleak... Oh, and answer. he's paralyzed! And he's oh. paralyzed, he can't move. Oh, that's so tough. That is a rough position for Chris to be in right now. Tumon's very, very low. This Sneasler is looking to do some so massive damage. Unfortunate. Yeah, and he's... Sneasler's not gonna... Or sorry, Tornadus is not gonna be able to get the knockout onto <laughs> Gouging Fire just right away. Um, well, oh he just doesn't God. have the damage out with Bleak Storm, but is definitely able to get a knockout onto Rillaboom, especially if he lands it for sure. But he oh. misses it onto Rillaboom and still gets a knockout on Gouging Fire, which is pretty surprising. And Gouging Fire is going to fall right there. This is might free up the Rillaboom for another turn, because if he does send out the King Gambit again, I'm pretty sure the Sneezer is going to want to try and close combat <laughs> that, that King Gambit to try and eliminate it. Battle, but he might throw out his Pokemon. Yes, the Chen Pao. That's another one he's going to want to close combat. Though, so. A really just decision to make. Is just weak to it's a bad yeah. position for Chris. No, you're right. Everyone is either two times weak or four times weak to see those close combat. <laughs> wow. it, it's a hard, it's a tough position to be in. Yeah. Obviously, you don't want to commit the close combat right away, just because like if you do, your defense is dropped immediately, and then you're obviously going to be like one hit KO'd. He's going for the, the Chien Pao. And it's uh, it's I a like smart that. play. I really like that. It's 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 just covering your ground, yeah. even if he decides to switch. Because you know that you're going to get the knockout as long as Bleak Wind Storm lands onto Rillaboom. You don't need to commit your attack onto Rillaboom for sure. And getting Rillaboom the dire threat in your, your season. And exactly. If he does switch, though, it will be bad for him, right? If he switches out to the King Gambit. Oh, he's going to switch out to the King Gambit on Rillaboom, which is, is probably a smart play. And you don't want to use the close combat too early here, because that does negate your already <laughs> tiny defense. Uh, yeah, and I did <laughs> mention it doesn't really matter, but here it kind of does, because with that grassy seed, actually can withstand some healing here. Yeah, so... Oh, that's oh. interesting, here. So, yes. Interesting. So, and... Uh, so, ah. if he kind of read, predicting the close combat, went to Terra, but Gus read that, oh. and the the Dire Claw is still going to hit regardless of the terrestrialization. Yeah. So, um, after that Bleak Wind's, uh, Storm, uh-oh, uh-oh, still, there we go. still standing. Thanks to that Grassy Seed, I think that actually might have been what kept him alive there. I do think that was something that played a major part in, in Gus still being alive here. Now has some interesting choices to make yeah. here because he knows the King Gamic does have Protect and so does the Chen Pao. So he's opting for the Sword Stance here. He's doing the hard read. He's gonna did he click Sword Stance? I think he I did. I thought he was hovering over Protect for the last you, time. You might, like, be, you might thought, be right. I thought the play was to go for Tailwind and then Protect just to hope that you live because obviously... Oh yes, yeah, so it's Protect, my bad. Yeah. Sneasler surviving here is the most important thing you want. That's your win condition. Sneasler is your win condition, right? You don't want uh, you know, King Gamma to be able to suck a punch. You don't want whatever. He, he instantly one hit KOs any Pokemon that he goes for. I guess except for Gen Pao, but Gen Pao's already in such a low HP state. They both he sucker punch. He sucker punched it, but it failed. They both sucker punch. They both Sneasler. Either crazy. okay, or maybe they sucker punch Tornadus. Watch the read. They go for Swords Dance. Yes, if he Swords Dance here, this is gonna be crazy. I think you have Imagine to. You I actually dance. think you have to. I think you have to. Yeah. There's no. No, I, he's gonna go for the combat. He's close gonna get combat. sucker punched. Oh! But the terrestrialization coming out is probably gonna go into Tornadus. Yeah. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. You and don't want to get ice spinnered here. <laughs> you don't want to get ice spinnered going for the opting to go for the Terra Dart. Which okay. is, is 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 that common on Tornadus? Ooh, that helps him eat the sucker punch though. There's another one coming out, and that's gonna take out the Sneasler here. Yeah, Sneasler's not gonna be that much. Leaping Storm, you just cross your fingers and hoping and praying that. It's not going to double miss, which we've seen before. Well, it misses yeah, one, but it hits its miss. target. At least it's it's it hits what it needs to. Yeah. Like I said, I felt like the play, you go for the sword stance, because you know that they're going to go for the sucker punch regardless. 
Um, but either still, it's kind of just a guessing game when going up against King Gambit. King Gambit is one of those Pokemon you just never know what you're going to do. And you still have two full HP Pokemon in your reserves. Yeah, so. Gus is in a really good spot right yeah. now. Is there uh, a Caledon? Tailwind's up. He gets the Rain Dance. Oh, oh, I'm saying. That's oh, I'm saying. Electro Shot can come out here. Yeah, I, I can finally get what I've been asking for. <laughs> I think this, this this might just be the game here then. With, Ooh. I mean, I don't think you honestly need to though, right? Because you're both like Gus is at such an advantage right now. He's up three to two, right? Rillaboom is low. You go for the Bleakwood Storm. Glassy Glide's gonna come up, but take out Tor like, Tornadus just right away. Maybe Rain Dance was the play, but again, like I said, you never know with these guesses. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, at least he locked in the Draco Meteor on. <laughs> Rillaboom here, securing the kill and turning it into a 1v2 situation. Afterwards to take out the King Gambit. Yeah, very true. Now, so I, I, I'm pretty confident here that this is most likely going to be Gus's game. Oh, with the Swords Dance, Sucker Punch. True, but you don't have any spread moves right here. I don't yeah. believe a Sucker Punch knocks out our Kaladon, so either way our Kaladon move, like, win, like, survives. Yeah. And gets a defense boost, which helps out with the body press. And Rillaboom, obviously, Plus the fake out. Plus the fake out. Yep. It's pretty much just cleaned up for Gus right here. Gus is just going to take the second game. And like we said before, oh well. I, I guess the, yes. the protect comes through, which is, is a smart play, right? You're not going to get hit by the fake out. You're not going to be able to get hit by the body press. Um, but it, it's pretty much just Gus's game. If we see a miss from body press uh, after the next turn, body press misses, and then uh, Rillaboom goes for Grassy Glide, but gets a Sucker Punch, then knocks it out. Then we might see something crazy after this, but all things going the way math is telling us, most likely. Yes. There's the yeah. body yeah. press. Body press is going to come through. It doesn't knock out King Gamma, which is surprising considering it's a wood hammer will though. Two body press, but yeah, wood hammer is going to be able to finish up the job. That's the second game. We're going to go into game three to see who can win the set and move on to face. Uh, what was it Angelo yep. in the grand finals? Yep, Angelo is going to be waning in Grand Finals already, <laughs> carefully studying uh, his opponent maybe. Again, so in the top four, all of these competitors will be stretch. getting points, but you want to get as many as possible here. Again, first place is going to walk over 30 points after today's competition. And both of these competitors here, both of these trainers, let me call them, call them by their proper name. These <laughs> trainers are, are demonstrating so much that they have the grit, they have the wits to really come away with a win here. So many strong reads and so many deep strategies have been put on display by both of them so far. I'm really eager to see where where they come through for this last game, you know, it, it really can come down to a lot of crazy mm -hmm. things. And I hate to beat a dead a dead horse, but we were talking about uh, Gus's ability to adapt to his opponent's play styles, mm -hmm. and he's done it perfectly, right? Time exactly. and time again. He did it in the last series that we just watched. He did it again now. Um, has changed up his entire strategy and focused on just, you know, handling Chris's team, handling what Chris has brought to him. He's a very, very good player in terms of adapting to the opponent's play style. And yeah, we'll see what happens in this third game. But who do you think is going to win? <sighs> I mean, I feel like there's still so much untouched with Gus's mm -hmm. team. Plus, you still have that strategy of the Rain Dance with the Argolodon that we still haven't even seen yet. I feel like there's just a lot more potential to kind of really hard commit for something really potent and scary. Um, plus, we've already seen so far the adaptability that Gus has. I, I do want to give the edge to him here, not to take anything away from his opponent, Chris, um, but... I still feel like uh, Gus has the advantage here. And, you know, with the adaptation we've seen so far, even just something with, like, switching Pokemon, I feel like if he brings Ogaporon into this next one, it would be really hard for Chris to deal with. Um, even the Raging Bolt as well. Um, there were some Pokemon that were brought up that didn't even really do anything here. It kind of was just, like, a 2v3 or 2v4. Yeah, that's how it felt like. So here we are. We'll start off right now. We have Gus leading with Tornadus and Arcaladon, and Chris with Ogre Pong and Frigorath. I know uh, you're excited about this Frigorath play. I'm excited, man. We finally get to see Chris bring out the Frigorath. We're going to see Frigorath all day. Frigorath, obviously, you know, a mainstay in terms of setting up Trick Room. Um, it also has Dazzling Game and Hyper Voice to sort of spread damage and you know, helping hands to help with damage output. I'm assuming it doesn't go for Trick Room right away, especially because of the partner, program, uh, sorry, partner Pokemon is Ogre Pong who's a fast, like, you know, attacker with base, like, 110 speed. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens here. Renate is going, opting for 
uh, the rain dance. The Ivy Cudgel coming. Oh, in with and the rain. Boxing out with the rain dance boost oh, just right no. away. Right. Yeah, that yeah. rain. <laughs> and we're finally seeing it. The strat I've been waiting for all day. Our Kaladon Electro shot. <laughs> He's just going to get it. the special attack boost right away. And because rain dance is active, because the rain is active, it's just going to hit right away. It doesn't need a charge turn. What? So because it's neutral, because of the grass type, it's only going to take half the hit. Wow, you're you're completely right. I, I, I kind of forgot that about Ogre Pond. Everything about that thing is blue, but it is a grass water. So it is going to neutral with that uh, lecture shot, but the special attack boost is still going to be there. It's definitely going to go down to the next one. Grass and slide. Um, that's another move to watch out for if you're trying to keep it. I'm sorry, did we miss it? Did Trick Ruff get Trick Room off? I, yes, wasn't, it did. I wasn't thinking it did, it did get Trick Room off. Okay. That's very interesting why he went for Trick Room for the first turn. I'm assuming that he's trying to switch out and hope to go to King Gambit here. I think <laughs> um, but, but now, Gosh. now our Caledon is going to be faster because of Trick Room. It's going to be faster than, I, I guess, not Ferrigraph, because Ferrigraph is going to be the slowest Pokemon on the field, but it's still going to be faster than Ogre Pong, who's, you know, the highest damaging uh, Pokemon on uh, Chris's side. And it's, it's interesting now, I'm pretty sure, um, I think you want to switch to Ogre Pong out. out. Go I for the Lilium's going to make its debut here for Chris, coming back out in this next and final game. But the Terrastalization is going to come out for Gus. I'm not sure what he's going to be putting it on. The Rillaboom, and that Rillaboom is going to be Oh, extra fire. grass. I, oh, no, this is the yeah, grass. Yeah, that's I grass. Think. I was looking at the wrong lineup there. Yeah, it's going to be the grass Rillaboom. So just adding extra potency to those grassy surges. But the Spiky Shield is going to be able to resist and completely nullify any attacks. Oh, but it's actually well, going to be gonna hit hard. it's going to go for. Onto the enemy Rillaboom. I really like that play. Reading that the Ogre Pond is going to be the Target so optic because you know you know it's gonna go for the protects just often to get rid of the partner Pokemon. I feel like it's the first time we're really seeing today the opponent reading uh, protects and playing around it. I feel like everybody's kind of fallen prey to the protect plays at some point. This our Caledon's getting very scary though every time it uses this move here. It did get blocked out that one time, but luckily it's not a physical yeah. move. It still does just get a free special exactly. attack boost. Yep. Even though it doesn't land, the great thing about this move is that A, it gets a special attack boost regardless what happens, and then B, you still get the amazing damage output of 130 like the damage, which is insane. So obviously you're going to opt for the Electro Shot again. That was if he had plus three special attack after this comes out. For, for those unaware, just for context, we're talking about the power um, numbers of these moves. Just for reference, like a, a good move besides these ones is like 80 power. Like that's a good move. You like that. 80 that's to 80 100. is a good move. If <laughs> we're not talking about 130, yeah, I'll take 80. Yeah, yeah, okay. Like, because without oh. the side effects of so follow, follow me, but it's not really going to do too much. I guess as our Caledon is going to be, I guess not fast enough. Mm -hmm. Sam High Horse Power comes out. Our Caledon is going to get the stamina boost, going to get the defense boost because of its ability. And Rilla, Rilla Boom's gone, I'm pretty sure, after this one. Yeah. Maybe because of the- Oh, Ash is going to oh, be on the Ogre, Ogre Pond. Pond. Obviously, yeah. it makes sense as well. You want to get this thing out as fast as possible. That's going to be a big Pokemon for Chris out of the battle. Now, you're going to have to worry about or work with all you have left. The Electro Shot also going to take down this Rilla Boom with that two times, three times now special attack boost. This is surely going to disintegrate this Rilla Boom, unfortunately, for Chris. Now, you're left with just two Pokemon. Yeah, this is such an insane Pokemon. The defense that it has, like, you know, the bulkiness that our Caledon has, on top of the stamina boost, on top of the special attack boost that it gets from Electric Shot. I, I think Gus is in such a good position with the Electric Shots being set up that it's pretty much just his game. And not to counter this Rillaboom either. Like, neither of these really counter it aside from the King Gamut, but it's still going to be a force to be reckoned with. There's only two more turns of Trick Room left. Yeah, Trick Room is a. Uh... King Gambit is, and for Ref, are the slowest Pokemon on the field. So this does help out Chris in his favor. He does have the opportunity to get a knockout onto our Caledon if, you know, he does double, double up. So we'll see what happens. Terra's gonna go out to King Gambit. He's gonna tear a <gasps> dragon. dragon. And he dra oh. used Draco Meteor this turn on the Arcaladon, onto the King Gambit. That was that such a hard read. Is genius. Coming out. That's genius. Because the Draco, this is this. Oh, is but he goes to oh. leave. Oh, he lives it though, because of the defense boost from stamina. 
Holy moly, Gus is in a very good position if this Draco Meteor can land here. There's the wood hammer, and that takes out the fear of graph here. And now, one final move is left in this turn. Will this spell the end for Chris here? Will Gus advance a little bit further here? There's the Draco Meteor. And there it is! It's super effective, of course it is. Gus and a crit. And a crit. <laughs> With three times attack. Gus just getting all sorts of luck going him, but you can't take it away from him. Gus played that amazingly. Wow, what yeah. a way to end this set. Wow. Handshakes all around. Gus takes the set two to one. Both sets that we've seen from Gus have, like, they've still always been close. But it's always Gus coming out, learning about his opponent, and then immediately being able to transition into, okay, how am I going to um, take down my opponent based off of what they've done in the first game? And he's played it very perfectly. This is, this is you, see, you see anime where there's enemies like this all the time. You know, the perfect prodigy, complete mastery of your opponent's style. You basically <laughs> absorb their powers. And those are always the scariest enemies. And I feel like Gus is that enemy today. Anybody that has to go against him really has to be scared scared of his ability to absorb your power and use it against you. That's not to count out his opponent, though, his For next sure. opponent, because they won 2-0 before even the first game was done here. Mm -hmm. So you know they have something very powerful ahead of them. It's, it's going to be Angelo is that opponent, the person that just sped through their own finals game. I'm very excited to see how this next one's going to shape up. Yeah, yeah and Angelo is going to be bringing out the Incineroar, a Pokemon that we haven't seen too That's incredible. Much today. Yeah. Has the Incineroar, has, has the Landorus, any? has the Tornadus. We haven't seen Incineroar pretty Incineroar. much at all, which, again, last generation was one of the highest usage, if not the highest used yeah. Pokemon in the format. Uh, and... and since it's been like legal, we haven't seen it too used too much, and like pretty much not at all today. Um, so it's gonna be pretty surprising to see what Angelo has. Yeah, much to dis the dismay of many, Incineroar is just such a potent and powerful Pokemon. Uh, parting shot alone, I'll, I'll be honest, as a move, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't think that move should exist. It's just such a powerful. <laughs> it, it's so powerful. The intimidate <laughs> first, wow. <laughs> then the parting shot, yeah, and then the intimidate again when it comes back in. It's, it, it's just, it's just unfair. <laughs> and the fake out. It, it's so. Just, it's just not fair. Looking not fair at his all. lineup here, I'm wondering if we're gonna see switch out any any sh switch out shenanigans. That used to be a very um, popular strat, mm -hmm. at least in singles. The, the format I'm used to, a little bit more comfortable with. You see a lot of switch out moves. The volt switches, um, the what the bug the bug type volt U turn switch, U turn moves like that coming out yeah. with parting shot being the only real one on his team. From what I can see, you're not gonna see those plays trying to get those constant procs of intimidate and the like off, which makes sense. In VGC, you only have four Pokemon to work with, and the format is so much faster in mm -hmm. terms of the rate that Pokemon are fainting, so you don't have the time to do those kinds of setups. Yeah. But getting that one drop, and then it's going to be two, actually, um, if Incineroar comes back in from the parting shot and Intimidate, it's, it's still... I yeah. can't even deal with the it. The good thing about Incineroar <laughs> and the reason why it's so good with Parting Shot is because it's such a slow Pokemon that for the most part, like 99 or I guess like 90% of the time, mm -hmm. you're going to be the last Pokemon to move on the field anyways. If Parting Shot comes in, you A, get an attack like drop already from using Parking Shot mm -hmm. and B, you get a free switch in to whatever you want. So it's way better than just swapping to any other Pokemon that you wanted, like, you know, you wanted to swap to. You get a free swap. It's pretty much like a no-brainer. And that's the real, uh, well, among many benefits, <laughs> it's one of the best benefits of the Parting Shot is it lets you switch in a lot more comfortably yeah. because one of the big downsides of switching in is you, obviously, you take all the damage from the moves that would have hit the Incineroar instead and you just have to kind of suck it up and take it right but with those reductions in the special attack and attack that incinerator is going to be laying out you can switch something in that's a lot squishier without the fear that it's going to get burst immediately now touching more on angelo's teams we haven't seen angelo play mm -hmm. really at all um you have the mainstays since this entire tournament. We got the Tornadus, we have the Landers, but the difference with the Tornadus on this team is that this Tornadus will be running Sunny, sunny day. day as opposed to... Um, rain, like, rain they dance. still have Tailwind, but as opposed to uh, Rain Dance, they're going to be running Sunny Day, mm -hmm. um, which obviously supports other Pokemon like Incineroar, like Fluttermane, like Raging Bolt, um, that, that Angelo also has on their team as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see you know, the sort of strategy that Angelo is going for. Obviously opting <laughs> not to use Torkoal, which has been pretty much <laughs> like the main sunsetter throughout this entire tournament. 
And I was going to mention, I never got the chance to say, and now I seem like less of a genius for bringing it up now, but I'm going to bring it up anyways. I feel like one of the best counters to those drought um, switch in sunsetters is just bringing a Pokemon with Rain Dance. Because yeah. uh, if you're relying on something like Drizzle and you're switching in like a Pelipper, for example, you're going to have to switch a Pokemon in. Mm -hmm. And then that's also going to all the downs that we talked about switching something yeah. in. You don't have to worry about that. You can just literally wait for the sun to come in. They can't switch it back on. They have to get the guy out and bring it back because no one wants to run Sunny Day. There's have obviously the, the upsides, though, with having of drizzle, course. with having mm -hmm. drought, of course. right? Obviously, the weather conditions are set up as soon but if as you're you enter the counter field. It, yeah. But yeah, the counter, the counter that it has with that is definitely great. Obviously, you do waste a turn mm -hmm. setting up those weather conditions, but it is good to be able to counter other weather conditions that you aren't really friends of, you know? Exactly. And but we, yeah, with all those yeah. possibilities in mind, <laughs> Matthias, you know, I, I'm so ready to see the grand finals, I but... Am. I'm so excited to see the grand finals. You know, sunny day, which will win out. The sun or the rain, we will see which go weather prevails. Let's go rain! <laughs> yeah. Let's go rain. I'm team sun, you're team rain. We'll see who wins. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back for grand finals.
And here we are after many, many long, hard-fought battles. We're here through rain, through shine. We are here with the grand finals, everybody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the grand finals of today, the We Play Pokemon VG Premier Challenge. We have World Circuit, World Championship points on the line. You get enough, you get to go to the finals, the illustrious finals, the ever-coveted finals hosted by Nintendo themselves. So, it will be an incredible thing to go to, and everybody here wants to get those points for it. You gotta get 500. You We're only 500. giving 30, but yeah. everything counts, and especially in Pokemon, every point yeah. counts. It does, especially if you do attend like those regionals and stuff where you do see a lot more points mm -hmm. being distributed. Um, so obviously it helps, but yeah, these 30 points, even though it may seem small, can mean the difference between qualifying for nationals, which, sorry, uh, the world championships, which is obviously, you know, what every player here is striving to do. Now, heading into the matchup, we have Gus versus Angelo. Angelo, a player that we haven't seen at all, realistically. This is Angelo right here against Gus, a player we've been following for the past three series right now. Um, going into uh, sort of this game, what is... I guess Angelo's sort of path into beating the ultimate, uh, you know, adaptability uh, player as Gus is. So honestly, I've, it's never happened to me before on a broadcast where I had too much to say before a break. But <laughs> I, I was honestly, where this is part two of the the lecture I was giving about the the weather theory uh, for the teams that these teams are bringing, right? So most teams, and it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, every turn matters. Doubly so in VGC, where things are so much faster. Uh, there's only four Pokemon you get to bring out, so every faint, every turn, everything matters. You don't want to spend a turn using weather if you don't have to. So, as a result, weather, super important in this meta because of Protosynthesis and Quark Drive. Right. You want to have the sunny day active, but you don't want to spend the turns to use it. So, what are you going to do? You bring Torkoal. Torkoal is a really good Pokemon. Brings the Drought, brings the Eruption from the first turn, and if you want to do Trick Room Stress, doom, you have a Sweeper. That's a really big threat. I think it even has Shell Smash, too. And we're getting to this first battle, but to wrap up my point as fast as I can, the, the real thing that really brings it home to make it so potent is with the drought and the weather setting being done from that wow having weather on pokemon like tornadoes to use is super important to counter those droughts and both of these teams have weather on tornadoes absolutely yeah gus going for the instant terror bug just as he did in the first game that we watched in his first series um going for that tornadoes with the taunt taunt <laughs> on the tornadoes a taunt on the tornadoes which is pretty funny. Obviously not going to be able to you get can't use taunt after taunt. taunt. <laughs> 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 All right, but we see the Earth Power, so that terrestrialization was huge there. That let him save his own life, and that's going to get the and defense get boost. And a boost. Oh my goodness. The Draco Meteor comes out onto Landers. Oh, wow. Landers able to live the uh, Draco Meteor with 18 HP left. And now you do get the special attack drop, but do remember, if he does go for uh, the, ra uh, the Rain Dance, Electroshock comes out. He's able oh, to get right. that special attack back up. That's true. I do think he's going to pivot, if I'm being honest. I don't think it's a very smart play to go for the Electroshots right now. I think it's probably a good play for Gus to try and pivot out and you know, bring him in later. Uh, but we'll see kind of what happens. I mean, it is the Landers you're playing to, but Thunderous, or, uh, yeah. Tornadus. Tornadus, right. For the Thunderous, the electric type. It is going to be weak to Electro Shot. But the speed's gonna get reduced. Stamina's gonna still be coming out though, so it's not all doom and gloom. The bleak wind storm protect is gonna come out on the Landorus, but it is still gonna affect the tornado. It's not gonna be huge. It is gonna be neutral damage. But the body press against the flying type is gonna get resisted, but it's still a considerable chunk of damage. And we still have those storms coming out. Just really, I would never thought I'd call this move chip damage, but that's all it's really doing so far in this. You gotta get that uh, arc. arc Truladon out. Yeah. You want it to survive as best as possible. But we're going to see the Raging Bolt coming out here, and this is going to be now a pretty big threat. It's going to yeah. use. Protosynthesis is now activated due to the booster energy. Like we mentioned before, our Caladon pivoting was probably a good option. This Bleak Storm is going to come through, and Walking Wake is just going to eat that, right? Uh, what's it called? Tornadus is just going to eat that. Um, so, honestly, a good play. Landorus is going to go for the Sludge Bomb, be able to get the uh, knockout on Tornadus right now. And now Gus, a little bit off on the back foot, but still in sort of a good position to try and bring it back. Um, bringing out the Overbomb. 
Ogapon is back. Uh, recognize that name. It's done some great things so far today. Uh, and I think this is going to be a nice, just, again, a thorn in the side, pun intended, because it is using spiky shield. But this is a Pokemon you can't ignore, and you also can't really pin down. It has a lot of good moves and bulk. And again, already using spiky shield, so you can't kill that fast. The thing is, the spiky shield is not going to be any like useful in this term at all. Really? Like, Tornadus goes for the Tailwind, mm. and Landorus yep. protects. There you go. This is just a great turn from Angelo right here. Angelo now gonna be in a really good spot right now. Uh, this, <laughs> the, this, this strategy of just using the Blink Wind Storm consistently, it's it's pretty risky. Cause I mean, again, it might not sound risky because it has an eighty percent chance to hit. Or, but Pokemon, that that that's still <laughs> a little too low when every turn is so important. But it's working for him Ooh, so far, that's and that's gonna be taking damage onto the Ogre yeah, Bomb right there. It is a Grass type, so uh, yeah. it's gonna be taking considerable damage. It's still in this. It's still alive, but it's really it's in really bad shape. Finally gonna take the Landorus down. I'm gonna faint force Angelo to bring out another Pokemon here. What he's gonna go for will decide to wrestle this game. Incineroar might be coming up. I'm interested to see that he brought it, but I don't think so. The Intimidate's not gonna do too much. And also, the Ogre Pawn counters the Incineroar there with the yeah. Ivy Cudgel being water type right now. It's not gonna be a good pick. Do one more Bleak Wind Storm, try and finish, finish off that Ogre Pawn. Now, Gus has some interesting decisions to make here. It's getting down to the wire. This is a scary turn. I think he drank a meeting. I don't think you go for any kind of sort of thunderclap or anything like that. You go for Drake Going for the thunderclap is interesting because you have the Bleak Wind Storm. There, yes, there is a chance that it misses, right? But you're still going to, like, 80% of the time, get the knockout. Um, so we'll see what happens here as we have Raging Bull going for the Terra Fairy, which is a great play. Honestly, that's, yep. you know what? That's smart, right? Um, I was just mentioning the Drake here. Didn't even think about the Terra Fairy. Um, and obviously, Angelo just read that perfect. And it's gonna get the knockout onto the Ogre Pond. It is scary. I'm not sure. Did Ogre Pond Spiky Shield last turn or no? Spiky Shield, uh, yes. two turns. Okay, so oh, it yeah. could have Spiky Shield. So, um, that is a risky play. I was gonna say, it, going for the Thunderclap there is just scary because the fact that Terrasalization could still come out on the side of Gus. Unless he's Terras. Oh, he did Terrasalize the Terrasalization. Or, or, or call it on my Yeah, call it on his Terrasalize to bug. Yeah, um, yeah, the Spiky Shield isn't so scary just because it is a special attack con, so it's not making contact damage. Mm -hmm. Um, right, so he but doesn't you still don't get, want to like, waste your turn. You, don't, you wouldn't want to waste your turn going for a thunderclap, and then it's just not going to. That land. is that is true. That's, that's that, that is was true. the scary part for me because it is such a predictable move. Speaking but of thunderclap, thunderclap go does it. go onto the tornadus, and <laughs> now the tornadus does end up falling. And now we're in the same position. We're in a two v two. Draco meter comes out, walking bull, uh, <laughs> raging. I said walking bull because that was the nickname. <laughs> raging bull falls, and now it's a two v one. A flash comes cannon out. Comes that's through. Wait. Oh, he's yeah. too My tanky. Goodness. Raging Bolt is just so bulky. That is insane. And this Incineroar is going to be very bad against the Sarcaladon, which is now a Terrid Bug. It's going to be very, very effective. One fire move, and this Golden Gate is going to fall. Yeah, it, it's it, like we like said, it's pretty much over at this point. Just the Thunderclap needs to come out. The flare was going to come out. Uh, yeah, that's going to be yeah, it's 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 going to be canceled. That's the first game for Angelo. But like we said, right? Gus is one of those kind of players who are very quick to change up their strategies, right? This team that Gus has put together has very like a ton of different ways, a ton of different win conditions, right? Um, obviously, you have the main win condition of his team, which is the Rain Dance into Arcaladon into Electroshot. You also have the Sneasler on the back line to be able to help out with mm. any of those, uh, you know, pesky dark types that we see super often, right? Like Angelo has two of them. He has Incineroar, he has Rillaboom. Um, so obviously it's able to help out on that end. Also with the Raging Bolt with the Terra Fairy, able to help out on that side. Um, Gus has a ton of different ways to kind of co like come about and change up his strategy going into the second game. But he doesn't have a lot of time left. He needs to try and figure out figure it out in this second game because it is still just a best of three. So now Angelo is on the Grand Finals winning point exactly. here. Just one more game to go for him. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me so far is... Uh... Bring it back to that weather discussion here. We haven't seen it making an effect, and it's because of the fact that there's no setters. You don't want to spend that turn doing it. But it is kind of a scary thing that might come into play because 
if you read that your opponent's going to get the weather off, you want to get it immediately nullified. So if you're reading that he's going to go for the rain dance, you want to make sure you sunny dance immediately, vice versa. So it is kind of a mind game that if there's ever both of those tornadoes on the field at the same time, that's something that they're both going to have to keep at the back of their mind as it is always going to be a viable option. And speaking of loading into this next game, maybe they're going to be leading with those tornadoes. Who knows? They might have to factor those weather plays right at the very beginning of this yeah. game. But in any case, I'm interested to see what kind of switches out they've made yeah. because you can again bring six but you only bring four into the battle and uh, right now we're starting off with the famed Sneasler and the Rillaboom lead this is what happened for that first one I like that play because of the grassy seed uh, because it's going to boost the defense of the Sneasler but Angelo might already be kind of prepared for that the sunny day there is no enemy tornadoes leading so you can't just go for that for free you also could just go for the Liquid Storm and both of these Pokemon are weak like week two week with Storm. Exactly. Um, I don't think you really need to set up Sunny Day, but he's going to choose to set up Sunny Day and go for the Weather Ball. Um, so we'll kind of see what happens here. The Fake Goat comes up from Raging Bull, uh, sorry, from Rillaboom onto Raging Bull, which is going to stop him, you know, from Raging Bull, uh, picking up the KO onto Rillaboom. The Sun still gets set up, though. It's going to be a big boost to the special attack. Diaclaw's coming out. It's going to hit the Tornadus, taking it about to half, and it's gonna be flinched because of that fake out hitting the Raging Bolt. Not gonna get through anything this turn, but I think he might have been expecting that, prepared for it. And the Weather Ball coming out would basically instant knock out this move. But yeah. we've seen it survive some other scary things. I think it actually has a good chance to survive this one. True, but we also have to remember the Bleak Wind Storm coming in on the side. If that connects. It is, if it connects, yeah. Still a 20% chance of it missing, which is a one fifth of a chance is still a pretty, you know, decent chance of it missing. I love that. We'll see Sneasler come out, which is a good play. You want to pivot away from the Sneasler. It's just one hit knockout from the Legal Storm. Going against the Art Caledon, which this is going to be great as it's going to pick up that stamina boost, right? But against the Weather Ball, I just don't know if that's the greatest pick here. It survives a Bleak Wind Storm, but gets the Wood Hammer off. Does this knock out the Tornadus? And yep. it does. That's going to oh. be a big pick for Gus here. Yeah, now Raging Bull is going to end up putting that Weather Ball onto Rillaboom. It's probably just going to pick up the Nako here. Yeah, I forgot that Rillaboom was low HP too. Yeah, Rillaboom is going to fall in 3 to 3 right away. Gus already picking up on his mistakes last game and now sort of playing it in even with Angelo. Now, what is the pick here? It seems like he's going to go Landorus, but what? Is Gus going to swap it? Do you swap it back to. What is heckin' Wimby? No, it's a, it's a tornado. <laughs> All right, he saved it. Gus has got great names. So, Wait, Golden Gate, Golden Gate. Those are because the electric shot and it's the fact that it's a bridge. Heckin' Wimby. Those, those are some good names. names. Here's this coming out though. Sun is on the field, and you're gonna bring your enemy tornadoes in. This is gonna be a prankster rain dance, most likely coming out. Set up for that uh, Arcaladon with those electro shots. You also want to do that because you don't want that weather ball exactly. to hit your hit your Arcaladon here, because that is gonna do a lot of damage. Weather, weather, yeah, weather. Now the tornadoes is gone on Angelo. He has no way to set back up. Exactly. So it's just perfect for Gus right now. It's like it, you're taking a risk by being the first one to do the weather because then it's all on, all eyes are on you. And you never want that in Pokemon, right? Being unsuspecting is going to be a huge advantage for you. You're going to get that Bug Terra as well. Just this making is such a great play. The Bug Terra. Hopefully, Gus goes for the rain as he probably is going to go for the rain. There it is. This prevents us being weak to Draco Meteor. Now, Bug type, that's not even going to be a threat. Yeah. The, Draco Meteor is not going to be a, like too much of a threat. Your Weather Ball is not going to be too much of a threat. He goes for the Thunderclap onto the Tornadus, but does he get it? Because Tornadus just set up Rain Dance. So this is just a great turn. I think that... Uh, and stamina boost. <laughs> hey, it's just... Gus is reading. This is Gus's game. I, I have this to say... Gus's this is Gus's world, and we're game. living in it. <laughs> <laughs> we're just side characters in Gus's story. Gonna go for the Draco Meteor, which honestly, I think is the smarter play than I was expecting to see the Electro Shot coming out. Obviously, it's not gonna affect the Landorus, but um, just getting that huge chunk of damage so that your uh, Tornadus can actually take down the Landorus, or at least force you out of protect, and then you can focus your attention now onto uh, the Raging Bolt. Tailwind now gonna just even make it so that this this uh, Arcaladon is going to be even stronger. The Electro Shot is going to charge up, reduce some of the downsides from that Draco Meteor, and it's going to take a nice chunky hit either on the Landorus or the Raging Bolt. It's, it's going to go for the Raging Bolt. It's not yeah. going to go to the Landorus, right? It is an Electric-type move. Nah. 
Well, yeah. I mean, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to land. Why not? Maybe he misclicks, who knows? But the, the Tornadus is going to go down. The super effective yeah. is hit is going to send it packing. Raging Bolt definitely not going to be taking much damage from that Electroshot, but what's more important is he's going to be getting yeah. a special attack back. The Sneasler is going to be returning. This is where things get scary. Yeah, the what? more important part of that is the fact that, you know, the Electroshot does raise the uh, special attack. And Tornadus came in, did its job. Exactly. Didn't need to come in and cause a bunch of crazy damage. It needed to come in and set up Brain Dance. That was its job. Now we have Sneasler coming in in the pivot. We'll see what happens here. Probably going to go for the Dire Claw onto the Landorus to try and just, you know, instant knock it out. Probably going to go for the Electro Shot onto the Raging Bolt again to bring it back up to neutral in terms of its special attacking stat. Um, so we'll kind of see as the Thundercloud comes up. Is the defense boost once again. There's the sword stance set up from Valesi the Sneasler. Now Gus is in a very good spot on setup. There's a flash cannon going towards that lander, is taking him out. And now it's 2v2. Gus is in a good spot. A little less HP than he would have liked though. But this defense stacking is going to be huge. Um, Thunderclap is going to be a move that's going to be uh, scary for it. But with Incineroar switching in, it's only really going to affect the Sneasler. Sure. But this Golden Gate... But it's it, it's, so it's still much. fine for, for Sneasler, though. Sneasler got a plus two boost from Sword Stance, but it's only going to be dropped by, like, half. So he's still, like, one still and a half up. times boosted in, in terms of attack. It has Stake out, to be fair. So does that fake. could put a huge stop He's, he's gonna tear a grass. I don't know why he would do that into the Sneasler, no. Unless he can take him out this turn, the poison it's the grass would be devastating, no? He's probably thinking that he's gonna go for close combat and then tear a grass just to kind of combat that. I see, but then I you see. also have Dire Claw in the back foot too, right? You have Dire Claw that's just... A, he is gonna go protect them, which, it, to be fair, fair, is probably pretty smart. You want um, your Arcaladon to try and get back up to... Yeah, going for the fake out. It's pretty fair. You want your Arcaladon to kind of get back Oh, I guess not. Going for the body press. It does amazing damage onto Incineroar, too. Incineroar going to eat that Citrus Berry to try and sort of mitigate the damage, but not, you know, too hard. Aging Bolt. With that Draco Meteor, doesn't care about how much defense you got. That special attack is going to be so huge. Going to be raising the defense even more now. But with Raging Bolt taking such a huge hit to his special attack, I'm not even sure if another Draco Meteor would even matter here. Uh, Brain, I believe, is one turn away from ending. So if you're going to Electro Shot, you got to do it now. I feel like this is the last turn. Of oh, the priority, goes, though. Right? The priority comes up. Our Caledon falls. And now it's just on to Sneasler. Sneasler needs to pick up a knockout here. We'll see what happens right now. This Dire Cloud comes through, gets another oh. reaching. Oh, and it's not even going to get a status effect. It's not even going to get a status effect. Not nothing. Flare Blitz this comes through. This could be it. This is probably it. Yeah, Rain Sneasler is, is not strong enough. And the Tailwind. Oh, the Tailwind is gone. <laughs> Sneasler is not strong enough to survive an attack from any of these Pokemon. This is it. Regardless of what it is. This is pretty much it. Angelo cleaning up <gasps> the final set. Two to nothing. Uh -oh. Dire Claw coming out though. Okay. That, <laughs> again, no status again. effect. The, the flare blitz through. And Angelo Woo! is declared okay. the winner of so this gracious. Pokemon VG Premier Challenge. Wow, uh, this is for this is, ladies and gentlemen, take it in. Look at, Look it. at, Look at the your winner. First take time. it in, Angelo. Yes. You're the first ever St. Clair College we're running with. We play Pokemon, the VG Premier Challenge. This is our first champion, Angelo. Going to take it out in a convincing fashion. I believe only losing one game all day. Yeah. And going to get a 2-0 in the Grand Finals. Really just <laughs> soaking it in, putting yeah. on a good show for everybody, and we appreciate that. Such a good battle. That Sneasler, you were caught. I, I hate to admit when you're right, because you, you love being right way too much, but I got to admit, you're right. Hey, what Sneasler. can I say? I'm a smart guy. Mm, you can say that, but Sneasler what? is such a good Pokemon, and it really did take everybody by surprise, and yeah, you were right. It really did. It's a very interesting pick to bring Sneasler. It's not a pick that you see very often. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of one of those like OU sort of staples that you kind of see. Again, a fast attacker, um, but like I said, super, super, super frail on that side. <laughs> it's pretty much just a one-hit KO for the most part. But hey, Gen Pal has a place in the meta. And Gen Pal obviously thing. has a place in the meta. True, true. Um, 
But yeah, it, it was very surprising to see a Sneasler come through. Did really great against, like, obviously the dark, prominent dark types that we see with Rillaboom, with Incineroar, um, and obviously with Dire Claw. Dire Claw really was kind of the special <laughs> for uh, Sneasler. Um, so yeah, it was honestly a great play. But you got to give all credit to Angelo. Angelo came in and just completely dominated, like, the, uh, you know, the top. Uh, what's it called? The top cut. Um, 2 owed one Undefeated. of the best players in the entire tournament. And then also, again, 2 owed a player who's super quick to change up his game plans. Um, so very, very well well played for Angelo. Yeah, absolutely. It was an incredible display of skill, talent, ingenuity, and innovation. And I think some of those are some of the most important qualities of Pokemon here. You can see some of the participants <laughs> who came out tonight. Huge. This would not have been possible without everybody's support. So we have to thank you all for coming out. And and of course, our talent, you can see some of the people help supporting the production. You saw Theo there. And, uh, you know, uh, it's incredible the amount of love and effort that everyone's been putting in today. Yeah, if we're going to be thanking things, we got to thank FNC House of Cards for, you know, organizing this whole event. And thank you to the St. Clair Esports Club as well. They are the ones who made this connection and made this all happen. And, and to We Play Pokemon. You know, Windsor exactly. Essex Play Pokemon. You know, thank you to you as well for uh, running the tournament. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And thank you guys for joining me here on the desk today. It's been an amazing time. I love Pokemon. I love seeing it. And it's been a joy to cast. Yeah, and of course, thank you very very much for watching um if you're a saints enjoyer you know tomorrow we have rocket league lined up so we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming for better or for worse tomorrow so be sure to be there and enjoy the action again rocket league tomorrow and hopefully this won't be the last time we're doing pokemon action because i know i've loved it i know you've loved it and i definitely know you've loved it my <laughs> friends so it's been a pleasure doing this with all of you guys today yeah, and it's been a pleasure for me to join you guys on the desk as well, too. It's my first time being on the desk. I'm hoping I can get back on, too, you know, with the next Pokemon uh, event that we run. So uh, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's been a joy. Your knowledge was very useful here. Gotta you say. know, you had the small picks there with the Sneasler found the, <laughs> found the secret hidden no power. Free graph, though. Yeah, no, no free well, we shot. did see one, but it didn't work out too great. Yeah. But <laughs> there's more, there's always more Pokemon to discuss, but thank you everybody in the back today. Mr. Danners, Theo, Amanda, Tommy was also back there. Chase as well. Chase really also. Lots of people today. Lots of work went into this to make this whole thing run. But anyways, thank you, the viewer, for joining us here. And we'll see you again soon. Good night, everybody.